What is up? What is up? Welcome to the Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marta Wilson. Thank you for joining me on this episode. And I am sorry for the technical difficulties. It happens, right? It happens. But we recover and we keep it going. We fight through the battle. And now I'm back at you again for another episode of the Gospel Truth. And I have another debate for you. All right, this debate isn't going to be an exciting one, a fiery one, I expect, man. Whenever I bring Unitarian on, the Christians on, Trinitarians and Unitarians get together, man, you know it's going to be a good one. Um, so I thank you for joining me tonight and thank you for waiting for us as we figured everything out. And I'm just so thankful for being in front of you today. Uh, I do want to go ahead and encourage you to like and follow the Gospel Truth. Subscribe, like the whole nine on YouTube and Facebook. Also, if you can go ahead and take time, you can go ahead and flow over to the podcast because all this content is on podcasts. I'm on all major platforms. I'm on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. So go ahead and check it out. And if you like the content, go ahead and subscribe. Do me that favor. Um, also, before I bring these guys in, I do want to go ahead and go over a couple of announcements I have coming up. All right, coming up on tomorrow, actually, March 20th, 2020, I have a debate, a pacifism debate. Does the New Testament, New Testament teach pacifism? Um, Mr. Todd Lewis, a pacifist, Zach Lesher is coming up, and they will be jumping on here to discuss that topic. After that, coming up, I have an uh, interview coming up after that with J.C. Jones. And we'll be discussing the face of evangelism. Uh, where are we as Christians to look like when we go out into the streets to evangelize the world? Um, that's coming up March 24, 2020 at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, I have another debate March 27th coming up. Uh, Mr. Robert Rowe, theistic evolutionist, and Seth Bloomsburg, young earth creationist, and Ebony Betty, which view is biblically consistent, young earth creation or theistic evolution? Uh, my dude, Seth Bloomsburg, will be jumping back on with me. If you don't remember, Seth Bloomsburg came in and filled in for a debate maybe a, about a week ago now. Um, so my man be coming through, and I'm sure him and Robert will put on a great show. And then lastly, I've coming up an abortion debate. So abolitionist versus incrementalist, uh, Mr. T. Russell Hunter, an abolitionist, and Ryan Williams, an incrementalist, and they'll be debating uh, abolition versus incrementalist, which approach toward abortion is more biblical. That's coming up April 6, 2020 at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Once again, that's just the next three sh four shows that's coming up on the Gospel Truth. So if you want to check out and see everything that I have coming up in the future, go ahead and flow over to the YouTube page. I have it all updated right now. So don't hesitate. And once you're there, subscribe and hit that notification bell so you'll be in the loop for all the upcoming shows. With that said, I do want to go ahead and bring in my interlocutors today, Mr. Sam Shimon. Hey, if y'all don't know who Sam is, y'all tripping, man. If y'all don't know who Sam is, he out there killing it continuously, man. He out there doing his thing. And y'all remember Andrew Griffin, man, him got down uh, on some on some on on a debate topic back in October last year. So y'all should be familiar with Mr. Andrew. Andrew, you know, you're trying to put a good fight. He did I. He did I, man. You did I, Andrew. You good, though. You good, man. But I'm glad both of these guys came on. So let me bring these guys in. What's up, fellas? What's going on with y'all? How are you? How you doing? Doing, doing good. Yeah, doing good. Doing good, man. I'm glad you guys joined me and everything, man, on this episode of the Gospel Truth. And fighting through the technical difficulties, too. That's always a challenge, man. So I appreciate y'all being patient and getting through it. Yeah. So right. sound, if you want me to hear, sounds good, right? You guys can hear me. and Everything sounds great. Everything sounds great. How about my buddy, Andrew? Can you hear me, Andrew? Yeah. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, pretty good. That's good. By the grace of God, it should go smooth. Hopefully. All right. Get that little quick sound check in. It's all good, man. It's all good. So we're going to be debating today, does the Gospel of John teach that Jesus is God? So that should be an interesting debate. Uh, this is be a date that I think a lot of people are watching right now, especially on YouTube. So I expect a great discussion. But before we go into the, the body of the debate or the body the format of the debate, I do want to give you guys time to go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience, if you, if, to whoever don't know you, all right? So starting with Mr. Sam Shimon, if you don't mind, if you can go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself. Yes, uh, I've become infamous for dealing with Muslims since, I believe, 1999. I've been writing for a website called Answering Islam. It's answeringislam.net. So my interactions have been primarily with Muslims and their attacks on the core doctrines of the Christian faith, which also includes criticisms and attacks on the Trinity, specifically the bi biblical basis for the Trinity. So I've been doing that since 1999, and I'm trusting that by the grace and mercy 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, that if he gives me health and holiness, I'll continue to do that until he calls me home. And I'm trusting the Lord Jesus to bless this session for his glory as we seek the truth of Christ in Jesus' name. So that's what I've been doing. All right. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate you for coming on once again. All right, Andrew, go ahead. Give a quick introduction to those who don't know you. All right. My name's Andrew. I do a little YouTube page called Unitarian Apologetics. Um, I'm a Christian Unitarian. I believe that God is the Father alone, the Almighty God, and that Jesus is the human Messiah and Lord and Savior. Um, I started out um, being interested in apologetics by um, um, dialoguing with various um, parties uh, such as Trinitarians and atheists, and I felt the need to give a verbal defense for my faith, and I started getting interested in Ravi Zacharias and hearing his videos, and I felt more the need to be able to articulate my faith, and the more I looked in, the more I realized and understood what I believe the Bible actually teaches, and so I became a Unitarian. Can you guys hear me? I don't hear you guys now. I can't hear. Oh. I can't hear more. Oh, no, I can. can you guys hear me? My mic was muted. My bad. <laughs> yeah, okay. I like your accent. Where are you from, man? I like your accent. Me? Or maybe that's. Yeah, I like your accent, bro. You sound like New Jersey oh, man, or I'm, something. Yeah, I'm from all over. Um, one thing is, I, I lived in Florida for a long time, and uh. uh and I used to hang around these guys from Puerto Rico, and there were these New Yorker guys from Puerto Rico, and that accent just rubbed off on me. And now I got this crazy California, Texas, yeah. New York, <laughs> weird accent. It's just all over the place. Right? <laughs> got, it all con got it all convoluted together. Huh? I'm so. coughing now. Hopefully it's not the right now. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to get into this debate, all right? the fourth, the, Once again, the topic of this debate is, does the Gospel of John teach that Jesus is God? All right, so the format is a 10-minute open statement. We're going to have a 60-minute cross-examination portion. Both parties will get three 10-minute opportunities to ask questions. Then we'll follow that up by a five-minute closing and then Q&A from the audience. Everybody good with that? Hopefully by the grace of God, yeah. All right, all right. So start, the, the topic is, does... She is, does the Gospel of John teach that Jesus is God? Uh, Sam Simone, you're arguing the affirmative, so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and go first for your 10-minute opening. Okay, let me know when I'm winding down. Again, I <clears throat> glorify my God and Savior, the Lord Jesus, and I ask for a powerful anointing from His Spirit to speak truth without error and to do it passionately for His glory and honor, the Father's eternal Son in Jesus' name. Now, I, I hope, because Andrew has debated Trinitarians in the past, he already understands what we mean and what we do not mean when we say Jesus is God. Now, obviously, I'm not a modalist, and I don't believe Jesus is the Father or the Holy Spirit, but that he possesses eternally the fullness of the divine essence of God, and he became flesh. Now, one of the ways to demonstrate that the Gospel of John <clears throat> affirms that Jesus is God is by looking at the chapter, the first chapter, and I'm not talking about John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word. More specifically, we look at the Baptist testimony. In John chapter 1, verse 23, John the Baptist identifies himself as the voice that cries out <clears throat> in the wilderness, the voice prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. In John 1.23, he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So clearly, John is what we call the shaliach, the agent. And I hope Andrew will bring up the concept of agency because unfortunately most Unitarians butcher the concept, making it say something it doesn't. But again, note, John the Baptist is the shaliach. He is the agent. And he's not sent to prepare for another agent. This is not a prophecy saying God will send an agent to prepare for an agent. God is sending an agent to prepare for the coming of Yahweh. How do we know this? In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 and 5, and verses 9 to 11. Sorry if I, if I sound like I'm rushed, because 10 minutes is not a lot of time. So I'm going to do justice to it by the grace of God, by the grace of the Lord Jesus. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh, Yahovah, yod He vav He. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So note what the prophecy did not say. This voice is preparing for God's agent. The voice is the agent. He is the Shariach of Yahweh. And this voice is preparing for our God. Now, for the sake of time, let me skip to verse 5. And the glory of Yahweh, the glory of Jehovah, shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Now, pay attention 
to that word. The glory of Yahovah, Yahweh shall be revealed, because that directly ties in with Jesus Christ in John 1, 14 and 15, which I'll get to in a minute. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Now again, for the sake of time, let's skip <clears throat> to verses 9 to 11. Behold your God. Behold the Adonai, Adonai, Yahweh, Yahovah. Behold your God. Behold Adonai, Yahweh. Not behold an agent, a shariach. Behold the Lord your God comes with might. And his arm rules for him. Behold his reward is with him. And his recompense is before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. So clearly, John is the shariach of Yahweh. He is sent to prepare for the manifestation of Yahweh, whose glory shall be seen. But now here's the problem. In John chapter 1, verses 26 to 36, the one that John prepares for is Jesus Christ. In other words, the Yahweh that Isaiah said was coming, Israel's God, whose glory would be seen, is actually Jesus Christ, so that John is Jesus' shaliach, his agent, because Jesus is the physical enfleshment of the God of Israel. This is why in John 1, 14 and 15, we are told this. <clears throat> and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out. Now notice this is a deliberate allusion to Isaiah, because the voice cries out in the wilderness, and the glory of Yahweh shall be seen by all flesh. But here we're told, John is the one who cries out, this is the, he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And Jesus' glory is the glory of Yahweh. In other words, it's not an agent preparing for an agent. It's an agent prefer, preparing for God to show up. And the God who shows up, it's not the Father, it's Jesus Christ the Son. This is further confirmed in John 1.18. John 1.18 says, no one has seen God at any time. Now this includes even the Old Testament. The Old Testament history. Any time means neither during the time of the patriarchs and the prophets. The only son, now depending on what translation Andrew <clears throat> will use, I don't know if he's going to use one that has only son or only God. Irrelevant. I just, whatever translation he wants to use, I'll go with it. So he can let me know what translation he prefers. But I'm going with the reading, only son, which is at the father's side has made him known. So notice what this passage clearly says. At no point in history... Has anyone seen God apart from the Son? It is the Son and only the Son that mediates God's presence, that reveals God's presence, so that if you see God, you must see God in the person of the Son. And this also includes Old Testament history. But now here's the dilemma for the Unitarian. Because all throughout the Old Testament, people did see God. I'm not referring to the angel of the Lord, though that too refutes Unitarianism and proves Trinitarianism. But I'm <clears throat> referring to passages where it says the God of Israel was seen, seen by Abraham, seen by Moses, seen by Isaiah, for example, because my time is winding down. Exodus 24, verses 9 to 11. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. They didn't see a shaliach representing the God of Israel. They saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. Now, again, notice what verse 11 says. They beheld God, not the shaliach, not an apostolos, God himself, and they ate and drank. And then Numbers 12, verses 5 to 8. God himself comes down in a cloud, a pillar of cloud, and rebukes Arian and Miriam, and he says this about Moses. He says, Moses is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles, and beholds the form of Yahweh, Yahovah. He sees the form, the shape of Yahweh. But remember what John 1.18 stated. No one has seen God at any time, which includes Moses' time, and the time of Isaiah and the patriarchs, but it says they did see God. Well, John 1.18 tells us who that God is that they saw, not a mere human Jesus of Unitarianism, but the divine Jesus who existed before he became flesh, and reveal God to even the patriarchs and the prophets because he is Yahweh, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now let me go to the example of Abraham. Now here's what it says about Abraham. Whom did Abraham see? Who didn't he see? Gen Genesis 12, verse 7. Doesn't say the angel Lord, even though the angel Lord is God, distinct from God, which refutes Unitarianism. But I want to be specific on text that says God was seen, not a shaliach. The Lord, Yahweh, appeared to Abraham. The Lord, Yahweh, appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar to Yahweh, the Lord, 
who had appeared to him. Genesis 17, verse 1 and 22. Genesis 17, verse 1 and 22. When Abraham was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to him and said, I am Almighty God. You can't get any clearer that the person appearing is God Almighty, the God of Israel, Yahweh, and not some creature invested with the authority of Yahweh, which again, <clears throat> I hope he brings up the concept of agency because it's going to backfire against my friend, as I will demonstrate by the grace of Jehovah Jesus, Yahweh Jesus. Now, then he stopped talking with Abraham, and God went up from him. Could the text be any plainer? It was God Almighty, El Shaddai, Yahweh that appeared, and then he went up, a manifestation of the God of Israel on earth. Exodus 6, verses 2 to 3. Then God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, Yahweh, and I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob by the name of God Almighty, El Shaddai, which is actually what we just read in John 17, verse 1. But by my name, Yahweh, I was not known to them. I, Yahweh, El Shaddai, appeared to them and made my, known, my name known to them as El Shaddai. Not a shaliach, not a prophet, not a created angelic being. I appeared to them, personally appeared to them. Acts 7, verse 2. He said, brothers and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Stephen, filled with the Spirit, says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Now, since Andrew is not a liberal and he's not a critic of the Bible like Bart Ehrman, he does not believe that the Bible contradicts. So the New Testament cannot contradict the Old Testament. And yet John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time apart from the Son revealing Him. The text says any time. That includes Old Testament time. If John is right and he's inspired and he doesn't contradict the Old Testament, that means the being that they saw in the Old Testament, the God that appeared as El Shaddai, the God that appeared as Yahweh, the God who appeared with pavement under His feet called the God of Israel, has to be Jesus because apart from the Son, you cannot see God, know God, encounter God. That's what John 1.18 says. No one has seen God at any time. Oh, yeah, the one only... minute. One minute. Well, my time is running up. So again, <clears throat> Jesus confirms that Abraham did see him because in John 8.40 he says, But now you seek to kill me, a man who's told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Jesus, what did Abraham not do? Try to kill me. But hold on, Abraham has been dead for 2,000 years. How could you say that Abraham did not try to kill you unlike his physical descendants? Because John 8 says, <clears throat> 56 to 59, Abraham saw me and I saw him. And unlike you, he was glad to see me, which again shows Jesus must have been there in person as an actual person, not an idea or simply a revelation. And Lord Jesus, more to come in the interaction. I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Sam, for that opening statement. All right, Andrew, you are up for your 10-minute opening statement. Okay. All right, you hear me good? Hello? Yeah, it looked like your feed, your feed froze up, but we can hear you, though. Okay. All right. Sounds good. No problem. All right. <clears throat> Matthew wrote the marvels of Christ for the he Hebrews. Mark for Italy. Luke for Achaia. But John, the great herald, the heaven wanderer, wrote for all Gregory of Nazianzus. We have to understand the spiritual nature of John's gospel what Clement called a spiritual gospel. Cannot be that we read a verse here and read a verse there, take it at face value and then understand what John is trying to communicate. There are several different layers of context that we should look into when interpreting any piece of biblical literature. First, we have the inner, internal context. We begin at the target text. For instance, if we read John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, this is a target text. We can look at, at grammar or various grammatical issues, define words, etc. Next, we'll move on to the paragraph and the chapter, the entire book, then all of the author's writings, then the rest of the New Testament, then the entire Bible. And next, we move on to the external context, such as geographical, historical, and cultural context. All, all of these together 
will paint the most clear picture of what is most likely the intention of the author's writings. John 1.1 1, 1 and John 20.28 20, are two of the most commonly cited verses trying to claim that Jesus is God, so I feel it's important to address those here in my opening statement. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. It's a very perplexing statement. How can the Logos be with God? God and yet also be called God or Theos. This very issue is addressed in the early first century by the Hellenistic Jewish philosopher named Philo of Alexandria. In the Greek, John 1.1 1, 1 reads something like, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, with the article, something like the God, and the Logos was Theos, without the article. Philo writes, it is the true God that is meant by the use of the article, the expression being, I am the God. But when the word theos is used incorrectly, that is more figuratively, it is put without the article. So when John calls the logos theos here, or God, he's implementing a catechesis, which is defined as an intentional misuse of a word to create a rhetorical effect. So the logos is called God here only in a figurative sense or catechistically. So what is the Logos? The Logos is essentially the rational, ethical, and moral order through which God created and sustains the cosmos. If someone were to say to you, show me God, you can't do it, right? You can't point somewhere and say there's God. But one way that we can know that God exists is because there's order in the universe. There is a rational order to things and there is also moral law. And and by contemplating on that order, we can begin to understand what God is like. Philo uses the illustration of the corona around the sun. He says, the logos is to God as the corona is to the sun. The sun's halo, which man can look upon when he cannot look directly at the sun itself. That is not to say that the logos is God as such, any more than the corona is the sun as such. But the logos is that alone which may be seen of God. Philo even goes on to call this Logos Deuterosteos, or second God, the image of God, etc., citing that this is all that can be known of God and what makes God known. Then in verse 14, the Logos becomes flesh and proceeds to make the one true God, who is identified as the Father alone, known. And once and what was once only discernible to the intellect was embodied in a person life in the body, person, and uh, in the person, life, and teachings of Jesus. So what was only once discernible to the intellect was embedded in the person, life, and teachings of Jesus. And secondly, in John 20, 28, after seeing Jesus resurrected from the dead, Thomas utters to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Here's four points concerning Thomas's utterances towards Jesus that we should consider. The resurrection is the context in which the utterance by Thomas occurs. It's only after seeing Jesus resurrected that Thomas utters these words. Number two, according to the Roman historian Suetonius, Emperor Domitian, quote, began issuing a circular letter saying, Our Lord and our God bids that this be done. And so the custom arose henceforth of of addressing him in no other way, even in writing and conversation, end quote. So while Domitian wished to be called our Lord and our God, Thomas called Jesus my Lord and my God. Emperors were said to be the earthly representatives of their gods and often carried titles such as God, Son of God, God Lord, Savior of the world, etc. And even though they had these titles, they were never thought to be the gods themselves. Number three, there are two other contextual evidences to to consider in chapter 20. 11 verses earlier, Jesus says to Mary, now go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and my God and to my God and your God. So clearly Jesus has a God. And just three verses later in verse 31, John writes, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God. Does John push the boundaries of what is comfortable? Yes. Does John have Thomas identify 
identify Jesus as Yahweh and thus collapse their identities? No. So wrapping up, here's three things I feel are important to keep in mind when reading and studying John's gospel. Number one, Jesus is not the word or the logos. The logos is a personification of God's word and shares many common attributes with personified lady wisdom. And after the prologue is predominantly used to refer to the teachings of Jesus. For instance, in John 14, 24, Jesus says, the logos that you hear is not mine, but that of the Father having sent me. Number two, Jesus being from heaven is not to be taken literally. In John 3.13, Jesus says, No one has ascended up into heaven except the one having come down from heaven, the Son of Man. But he says all of this within the context of being reborn or born again. The, second, the idea of second birth was also mentioned by Philo. Philo says that Moses' ascent at Sinai was a second birth and says, quote, the calling above of the prophet is a second birth better than the first. Baruch 3.29 asks, who has gone up into heaven taken and taken her and brought wisdom down from the clouds? There's Greek lexicon says concerning the phrase in, ascended into heaven, quote, it is commonly maintained that those persons are figuratively said to have ascended into heaven who have penetrated the heaven heavenly mysteries. So then Jesus goes on to say, do not wonder that I say to you, it is necessary for you all to be born from above and that unless you are born from the water and spirit, you are not able to enter the kingdom of God. Number three, we have to ask ourselves, who did Jesus self-identify as and what does he say about himself? Jesus says, I came not on my own accord, for I have not spoken on my own authority. The father who sent me himself has given me the commandment of what to say. I have not come to do my will. The Father is greater than I. My teaching is not my own, but his who sent me. A messenger is never greater than the one having sent him. He who is not honoring the Son is not honoring the Father, the one having sent him. I can do nothing on my own. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And finally, for as the Father has life in himself, so also he granted the Son to have life in him himself. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus seems to go out of his way to tell us that he's not God, that he's subordinate to God, and that he has a God, that his teachings were not his own, but his Father's, and that he came to do his Father's will and not his own. In closing, John writes, summarizing the Gospel, that, quote, all these things were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that believing you may have life in his name. Not that he's God, but that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. And when I say God, I mean, and I believe it's commonly understood to be the supremely intelligent, supremely powerful being, Jesus was shown to not to be that being or person throughout the entire Gospel of John. And I'm done right there. All right. Thank you. Thank you both for your opening statements. Appreciate you. So, Andrew, I'm going to fix that screen real quick. So, give me a couple seconds. We're gonna, I'm going to fix you up real quick. Awesome. Hold up one second. Andrew, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you All hear right. me? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, 
I yeah, I just want to finish up before we go into this cross examination portion. All right, so thank you both for the opening statements. Appreciate you both. All right, now we're entering to our cross examination portion of this debate. All right, once again, this will be a 60 minute cross examination portion. Both parties will get three 10 minute opportunities to ask questions. Um, also, audience, if you have any questions for the interlocutors, go ahead and make sure you post them. I will capture them. And there will be a Q&A after the closing statement. So as you hear this cross-examination portion, if those questions pop up, get them in. Please get them in. All right. With that said, uh, Sam Simone, you have your first 10-minute cross-examination of Andrew Griffin. Okay. Uh, you actually, again, uh, when I say again, you appealed to Philo and gave the misleading impression that Philo thinks that the word is not personal but a rational a principle. Uh, cite to me anywhere from Philo where he denies the personhood of the Logos. Give me one citation where for Philo, the Logos is not a divine person distinct from Ha Theos because you even misapplied Philo's <clears throat> point of the lack of the definite article be before Theos and imposed that on John 1.1, 1, 1, which we'll get to in a minute. But I want you, because I have Philo in front of me, I want you to cite where Philo says that word, the Logos, the Deuteron Theon, is not a divine person distinct from God. Quote him, denying the personhood of the Logos. I mean, I'd have to refer you to his whole book, to his whole book of no, works. You don't have I mean, to. You can uh, show me. No, no, no. If you study Philo, you have the book. That means you have no excuse. You've studied it. That means you studied in context, unless you're just gold mining, taking snippets out of context. Show me in the context of Philo's writing. It should be easy. You found a statement where he's called Deuteron Theon. Show me where Philo yeah, says. Yeah, I, I, actually, I actually gave that in my opening statement. I, I, I gave uh, that in my it. opening statement. That's repeat what I, I described. I gave a direct quotation from Philo about Give what the Logos was personal. and how he says that the Logos, mm -hmm. in the quote I gave you about the article, he says that what is, what is a called what is called God through a catechesis or an intentional abuse of language is his most ancient word. That's what you're, the Logos you're, is. You're I, I have to refer to you to his, to his, yeah. to his uh, entire Andrew. work and to see Andrew, that. And because our time is fleeting, you're filibustering. I didn't ask you to show me where Philo calls him God without the definite article because that refutes you. You don't call a rational prin principle and impersonal force a second God unless you believe your ideas are also different human beings distinct from you. Show me where Philo says the Logos is not a person because what you cited actually assumes he is a person distinct from God subordinate to God. I'm waiting for the reference. If you don't have it, just say you don't have it. So I can move on to my next question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't have it in front okay, of me right good. now. All right, secondly, uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, you, you tried to depersonalize the word and saying it's simply God's rational principle or his idea that then became embodied in Christ. Uh, turn to me to John 16, 25 to 31. Turn to John 16, 25 to 31. Now I can read it for you and I want your take on this because I'm going to read it. I know it's going to eat up my time, but still, this is important because I need to deal with your distortion of John. John 16, 25 to 31. I have told you these things in Proverbs, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in Proverbs, for I'll speak to you plainly about the Father. So he's going to speak plain, not metaphor, not hyperbole, not layers of spiritual meanings, which you tried to impose on John. This is now plain language that even my seven-year-old can understand. And that day you'll ask in my name, and I'm not saying to you that I shall ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God, I came from the Father, and have come into the world. As I said, I am leaving the world, and I'm going to the Father. Now before I finish the rest of it, do you know what the Greek construction is, going to the Father, specifically to the Father? You know what it says in, in Greek? Greek? Yeah. Greek construction? And what I just read, let me repeat it. And I'm going to the Father, the phrase to the Father. Do you know what the Greek construction is? What the words are? I mean, if you don't, just let me know so I can read because I have my time. I don't want to eat my time. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. Okay. Proston patera. Remember the word pros, proston patera. His disciples said to him, yes, now we, you are speaking plainly with no figure of speech. Now we know that you know everything and do not need anyone to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. So... Jesus speaking plainly, and the plain words of Jesus made them realize okay. you did come from God. So here's my question to you. Do you believe that Jesus is going to the Father? Was personal that he went to the Father as a person or as an idea? Because he says, I'm going to the Father. Now let me repeat what I'm not saying. I didn't say go, going back, because I know you Unitarians make a big deal that the word back is not in the Greek. 
Pay attention to my question. Going to the Father, did he actually go to the Father as an actual person or as an idea? He went did to he, the Father he, as a person. Is he a person. Is he a person in heaven or is he an idea? Right now? Yes, when he left. Obviously, he's still in heaven yeah. unless you don't believe he's in heaven. He's a person, but, but what, what you're doing is you're failing to see well, the context here. Before you assume here. what I'm doing, I, I'm, the context is going to refute you. Before you assume what I'm doing, so you said yes. So now here's my question to you. Since the going to the Father is personal, he went there personally, actually, not as an idea. Why then do you allegorize this first part of the sentence? Because he says, I came from the Father into the world. I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. If the leaving the world, going to the Father, is an actual person that's doing it, what consistent exe exegetical contextual reason do you have then to depersonalize the first half of the statement, especially when he uses the same preposition pros in John 1, 1, which I will get to. So now show me your consistency. The going to the Father is actual, but the first half in the same context. That's plain language. Notice, plain language, not metaphor. So don't try to allegorize or spiritualize it. He's speaking plainly. I came from the Father into the world. I'm leaving the world okay. going to the Father. All right, all right. You want, me to video, you want me to answer? I got, what you, I got your yes, question. Please. I'll try to answer now. Okay, please answer all it right, to the uh, point. Breaking... No tap dancing, please. Okay, I'm not tap dancing, but here's no, the thing. Saying, so no, this, I'm not saying you will. In case, the hour, the hour is okay. I can like if you're gonna let me respond. I can respond. Okay. Well, no, wait, the wait. hour, the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures. What you're saying is that one yeah. verse later, now all of a sudden, that's the time he was talking about. No, and he's still Peter speaking in figurative it. language. Yeah. Now his disciples now say in verse 29. Fully. Yes, no, no, now, no, 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 no. if you don't let me respond, let now me respond. You, you keep talking over me. It's just not going to work speak. like that. That's not how conversations hey, work. Hey, Sam, let him, let him respond, Sam. Let him okay. respond. No, Mar, I'm just hoping that he doesn't ignore right. that. Peter, you are speaking. Okay, plainly. just let me talk, and we'll, and we'll, fig we'll figure it all out. We'll hash it out, all right? Thank we can you, have sir. a separate conversation so. at, at length. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Figure it out. Then you'll repent. All right. So he says in verse 29, his disciples say, yes, now you are speaking plainly. What Jesus tells them after that, is that you don't even know you still don't understand what i'm saying because he says oh now do you believe i'm telling you the hour is coming indeed has it come when you will be scattered each to his own and you will leave me alone they still don't understand what he's saying because jesus says the hour is coming when i will tell you clearly but at the time okay. present in that context in that that narrative he's still speaking in figurative language jesus coming from the well, father is not to be taken literally but him ascending to the father is to be taken literally Okay, so thank you for just showing your inconsistency. Let me respond, and you can answer. Number one, no. Do you now believe means you finally got, got it now? I don't know how you're explaining Jesus' words away. I hope you don't do it with the rest of the scriptures. But I want everyone to hear what no, you just said. The going there, no, he says, do you believe now? Can you read the Greek for me and tell me what the Greek is? is what Greek? does the Greek I can, mean? Can read, I can read English. I can read English, okay. and the English, well, don't you have to understand me. what he's saying. You can read it in any language you want, but if you don't understand what he's saying... It, okay. It's irrelevant what the language Actually, is. What he's relevant. saying is that, oh, now, oh, now you believe, but he proceeds to tell Thank them you. why they don't Even really you believe. It, you finally got it, guys. But still, you just refuted yourself. You just said the going there is actual, but the first part's allegorical. Why then do you assume the going is actual? Because after all, according to you, he's still not speaking plainly. So how do you know his words are plain that he is returning or going there as a person? What makes you think that is plain, but the first part is figurative? Because I've read the whole book. What I don't, I don't do isolate you? target text and then and then and try to and try to uh, you know magnify those to try to make a point. I've read the whole book and I understand the book as a whole. So I understand this context and I and I move like I said in my opening statement. I move through all the different contexts to understand what's being said. So that's how I can say that because I understand the book as a whole. I'm not isolating okay, the target well, text and trying to uh, exploit it to make a point. Well, you are because let's go back to John 1 see if you understood it. Now, when it says, and the word was with God, do you know what the preposition is there with? Yes, pros. Okay. Did you hear when I quoted John 16, Jesus said he's going to the Father, pros ton patera. And in John 13, so, 3, what? another passage. Well, let me tie it in so you can see where I'm going with this. In John 13, verse 3, in John 13, verse 3, Jesus again uses, <clears throat> or I'm sorry, yes, he uses similar language. Here. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he came from God and was going to God. Going to God, the word to God is prostanteon. 
So you just admitted the going to God, the pros tantion, pros tan patera, means he's going there as an actual person in fellowship with God. On what contextual exegetical basis do you then depersonalize pros in John 1, 1 and 2? Let me explain my question again. If it says the word was with God, pros tantion, and then later in the narrative, the historical Jesus says, I'm going pros tan theon, same Greek construction, pros tan patera, it's same with the difference instead of saying God, he's saying Father, making it explicit, the identity of that God. You just admit that part, he is going there as an actual person to have fellowship with God. What contextual exegetical basis do you have to then depersonalize the fellowship between the Logos and God when that preposition and a similar, if not same construction of John 1, 1 and 2 is used elsewhere to refer to an actual person going to be with another person to have actual fellowship with? Because you have to understand the prologue as part of the whole book. The prologue is an introductory section that's apart from the whole book. So you have to understand and make sense and, and find fluidity within, within the prologue. You have to understand what it means, okay? So you're trying to say because pros means this here that it means pros there, and that's and that's a problem. And that, All right. I, I believe that's the root of your problem. All right, okay. that's time right there. That's time. All right, Andrew, is now your 10-minute cross-examination portion for uh, Sam Shimon. All right. All right, one second. Let me know when you're ready. I'll start the time. Let me get to it. Okay, I, I thought we were going to have a, a five-minute response, but I guess that's at the close. All right, no problem. Okay. All right, Sam, are you ready? My, my friend, come on, my brother humanity. All right, let's go. All right, so the question is, yeah. what, uh, in, the, in the title, Son of God, mm -hmm. uh, the word of can be defined as expressing the relationship between a part and a whole. Do you accept that definition? I don't know what you mean by part of a whole. Because so if you God have so so part of the whole, you have the Son, and then He's of God. Yes. Okay. And so the yes. Okay. So what does the word "of" mean to you in the title "Son of God"? That He belongs to God. Is that how you want me to define it? Yes. Okay. So okay. so who is God? In that, in there, that, that, in that equation. Father, right? Yep, that would be the Father. Okay. Is okay. is the Father ever called the Father of God? No, the Bible doesn't need to. It doesn't need to use could that the, language. Could 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 the Father be called the the Father of God? It, he could be if the Bible writers wanted to call him that, but I'm limited to what the Bible but, says. So instead of assuming and hypo hypothesizing, Giving me a hypothetical, let's deal with the language of the text. Does the text say that Jesus, Son of God, who's God in essence? Yes. But go ahead. What's your other question? So, all right. So John 5, 27 tells us that the Father has given authority to the Son. Sure. When was okay. Jesus, according to your understanding, given authority? You're saying in that context, he's been given the authority as the son of man, as mankind's representative, because he became flesh and he represents mankind. And therefore, he is qualified to judge mankind because mankind can't use an excuse against him saying, well, you don't know the human plight because you don't know the human condition. And Jesus says, yes, I do. I'm okay. Human. All right. All right. All right. So when was, so you're saying that Jesus did not have authority at one point and then received no. authority. Is that what you're saying? No. But you just uh, no, said it's all. okay. So saying. when was he given yeah. authority then? Yeah, well, you're, you're, in the Jesus. passage you're, you're giving me, I'm trying to answer you. But if you want to talk about that's fine because I'll talk over you as well. In that passage, Jesus is saying that he's been appointed to judge because he's the son of man. Now, obviously, Jesus only became a son of man when he became flesh. But it doesn't follow that the authority to judge wasn't something he possessed prior to that. What Jesus is simply saying here is that because he's man, he is fully qualified to judge mankind because mankind cannot use the excuse against him saying, well, you don't understand. So he wasn't the given authority. So he, he wasn't given no, authority is what either. you're saying. He already he had it the whole, whole time is what you're saying. Well, I mean, you cut me off. I can't hear you breaking up. I, what, was he oh. given authority or not? Uh, it depends on how you define given. And what do you mean by given? At one, at, at, at one point, he did not have it, and it, it was given to him. 
Where, where would the Bible imply that he didn't have this authority prior to becoming flesh? Because it says it was given to him. That's what words and mean. Where, where does it say that prior to the giving of the judgment, to judge mankind as their representative, that Jesus as God didn't have that intrinsically? John 5, 27, and he has given him authority to execute judgment. John 17, what? 2, for you granted no, no, him authority wait, wait, over work. all men. So when was he growth. given or granted authority? Okay, okay. It's a simple Listen, question. Gonna, do you not know? Or do you right, have an answer? Have you ever thought that one out? Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's let Sam respond, uh, Andrew. Yeah. Let's let him respond. Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah. your misuse of the scripture, your dishonesty, and I'm going to call you out for it. Why didn't you finish the verse? And has given him authority to execute ju judgment also because he is the son of man. Conveniently, but he's still your... given authority. Okay, can we finish the point? This no more proves that Jesus did not possess this authority by virtue of being God, but now he exercises it as man representing us, then Jesus giving the kingdom to the Father proves that the Father can't be God in 1 Corinthians 15, 24. So if I apply your distortion of Scripture, your I said Jesus, you just prove the Father can't be God, because in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then comes the end when he will deliver up the kingdom to God the Father. So when did God the Father lose the kingdom for him to receive it from the Son? You can't ask me questions during the cross examination. Well, let me make a statement. All right. According to your All right. way of interpreting scripture, right. let me finish you, the point. You can't ask me questions. All right, we'll move to the next question. All right. Let's see. Jesus says, Jesus says that the Father is greater than I. Yep. How is the Father greater than Jesus? So you're quoting John 14 for me, which is excellent. So let's see what does he say in John 14 to understand the kind of greatness. You're assuming automatically it means greater in essence, but not in position. Now let's see if you're right. I'm just going to read the chapter. Uh, no, I'm not. No, no, no. I didn't. No, you're assuming what I'm asking you for. Please don't. Can do I, that. Can I'm just asking you a simple question for the sake of time. Please answer. answer. How in what way no, I'm do up my you time believe the Father moment. is greater? Just a, just a short answer. No, in I can't. In what way you. do you don't believe answer, the Father is greater than Jesus? Marlon, all right, uh, all right. Take, take consideration that there's a little delay there. So you guys are talking over each other a little bit. So let's let's uh, ask that question. Let's let it and give her time for a response. You know, let me answer because like you were saying, I shouldn't cut him off. Before I even finish the answer, he's jumping because he's nervous, but that's okay. The context will define what it means that the father is greater than the son. Not in essence, but positionally. And let me prove it because I got to read the chapter, right? John 14, 12 to 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes me will do the works that I do also. And he will do greater works than these. Same word. The disciples will do greater works than Jesus did. My zone, the same Greek word. Because I'm going to the, my father. But it's not going to be better works than Jesus. It's the same kind, but a greater number. And why will they do greater number of works than Jesus? I will do whatever you ask in my name. I will do whatever you ask in my name. That the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So number one. Jesus says when he returns to the Father, he will personally do everything, do all the miracles from heaven through the apostles, which means that he has to be omniscient to know who's asking him, omnipotent to be able to do what they ask. But then in John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, if a man loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him. We, Father and I, will come to him and make our home with him. So Jesus claims to be just as present to the same degree, to the same extent, that the Father is with all believers showing that he is essentially equal to the Father because he's omnipresent like the Father, omnipotent and omniscient. Therefore, contextually, it oh. cannot mean the Father is greater than him, in essence, only in position because Jesus was on earth in the status of a slave. So please do not misuse that passage to prove something it wasn't intended to prove. All right, so, I mean, here's like that's like a short essay response that was really just Hello? what you're saying is that he's it's a simple answer is all I was trying to get. So you're saying that Jesus was positionally greater than the Father. No, the Father is positionally greater than the Son. That's, that's, that's why that's, I, said I didn't say anything about I didn't say anything about the ambiguous word essence that I that I guarantee you won't define. I'm talking about no, you're saying that he was positionally. Positionally great. You gotta understand. Now there's a lag in this, so I'm not trying to talk over you. There's a lag, and so every time I speak, you're speaking. So I'm, I apologize for that. That's not what I'm trying okay, to do. Okay, that's good. That's fine. Right, so I'm just go saying. Ahead, Adam, you so what, what you're saying is that positionally, the Father is greater than Jesus. Yep. Sure. Because Jesus is on earth in the status of a slave, and that's why it says, "Rejoice that I'm going to the Father." Because once I go. That won't be true because he will now dwell in the same glory that the Father possesses, which the Son shared before the world began. And I hope you bring up John 17, 5. We're going to have fun with it. 
I surely, I surely will. I hope you do too. Please. Can we make that next? <laughs> Yeah, let's let's make that happen. All right. And so but so at what point? So you're saying once Jesus became a man at that point, he was in a less position. But until that point, he shared equal power with the father. Uh, I, I don't know how you're understanding what I'm saying, because you said equal power at no point in time, even on earth, did Jesus lack the the almightiness that he possesses in common with the father. So I don't know what you mean. You're saying. Power oh, please, in the sense. Please of, clarify what you mean by positionally. What, what do you mean by positionally? Please. The clarify. status of a servant. I mean, clearly, Jesus in John 13 got up and washed their feet, assuming the status of a servant, something that the entire New Testament teaches was the case when Jesus was on earth. And Mark 10 45, do not think that the Son of Man came <clears throat> to be served, but he came to serve and offer his life as a ransom for many. And Matthew 12 17 18, quoting the prophecy of Isaiah 42 1. Being fulfilled, and Jesus says, Behold my, my servant whom I love. Luke 22, 27, Jesus says that he's here, not as one who is to be served, but as a servant. So the Bible teaches that Jesus on earth was in the status, the position of a servant. So he made himself nothing. And you know the passage in Philippians 2 where it says he took on the position, the status yeah, of yeah. a servant. So that's why. So if All you right. are my servant... I am greater than you, but not in essence, in glory, in, well, when I say glory, let's put that aside, in essence and in value, because you're still human to the core, but I have more authority over you, even though you may be smarter than me, better looking than me, and can beat me to a bloody pulp. That's the point that Jesus is making, no more, no less. All right, uh, Next, the next part of this question, Jesus says that a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one having sent him. So yes. according to your theology, was Jesus sent from heaven? Yes, and actually that just proved my point. Thank you for quoting it. Because Jesus is the servant sent by the Father and his messenger. But no Trinitarian says that Jesus is greater than the Father. Can you show me in that verse where it says a servant and a messenger cannot be equal to the one sent or equal to the one that he represents as his messenger? It said greater. I don't know of any Trinitarian that thinks that Jesus is greater than the Father. All right, that's time right there. Oh, that is, that is, that's time right there. All right, Sam, you have your second go-through, 10-minute yeah. opportunity to ask Andrew questions. All right, let's go back with piggyback off what he just said. The passage you just quoted, can you show me where that passage says that the servant is not equal to his master in some sense or the messenger is not equal to the one that he <clears throat> conveys a message for? Because it said greater. And can you show me a Trinitarian that says Jesus is greater than the Father? So I, I I so okay so I guess you're saying that he's not greater they're equal they say no, that he's saying the, the, I'm not, I'm, the father's not greater than me we're equal is that I mean I I, no. I guess is no, no, that no, the point you're trying to make that. I'm trying to show you mis you see the the problem I'm having with you is you keep misusing passages to teach something that they don't teach you are trying to use this passage to show that Jesus is less than the father when the passage didn't say that it simply said a servant is not greater than his master and i don't know how this makes your point because we do not believe jesus is greater than the father in essence or authority he's equal to the father in essence and while on earth was subject to his authority as a servant but that made my case are you saying a servant is not equal to his master in essence i didn't say anything about essence we haven't nobody's defined well, that I, well, word uh, that it's, it's a foreign no. word to me at this point no okay in, nature in so if i have a servant in the house i have a maid my maid is not greater than me does that mean she's less human than me but i didn't say anything about nature i'm talking about say, position I when i when i say greater i didn't say anything I'm about asking. essence i'm talking about in power when i define god in my mm -hmm. opening i said a supremely powerful person i'm talking about power here not essence okay so arnold schwarzenegger here, forget Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, let's go with Floyd Mayweather is my servant, and yet he can whip me like I'm a redheaded stepchild. So are you saying that if someone's my servant, that means I'm more powerful than them? What does that got to do In with uh, What does servant have to do with a person's power or lack thereof? Where are you getting this from? Because you use this passage. You use it. I didn't use it. You did. 
Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what you're trying to say. Yes, yes. Someone mm-hmm. who is somebody's servant is not as great. Is not as great as the person who sent him. That's what Jesus That's said. That's not what I asked, Andrew. I didn't ask that. You said power. Notice how you keep switching words on me. You went from power to greater. I didn't say greater. I said power. Can I have a servant that's more powerful than me and stronger than me, yes or no? But you're talking about physical strength. I'm talking about that, authority. That I'm talking about. Okay. Let's move on to another passage then because, again, it's it, you're not getting it. That's okay. That's fine. Okay. Now, in John 1.18, it says, no one has seen God at any time. No one has seen God at any time. That includes the Old Testament. I just gave you verses, and I hope I don't have to repeat myself, but I will because I don't want to eat up my time. It says, the Lord Jehovah Yahweh appeared to Abraham, Genesis 17, 1, and said to him, I am El Shaddai. It didn't say an angel. It didn't say the Malach Yahweh. It says the Lord appeared. And then after finishing his conversation with Abraham, he went up. And then it says in Exodus 24, 9 to 11, they saw the God of Israel. It didn't say the angel. It didn't say Malach. It says the God of Israel. And they saw what looked like pavement under his feet. And they saw the God of Israel, and they ate. John 1.18 says, no one has seen God at any time apart from the Son. Who was that God that they saw visibly? Who was that God that they saw visibly? Well, that's a self-refuting point because the Bible says over and over again, no one has seen God, but now you're saying that people saw you Jesus. Ask me, so it's a ask me that point. question. Ask me and I'll show you, you again misinterpret that passage. But you still didn't answer my point. They did see God. Unless you're saying the Bible is contradicting itself. So you're not answering the question. Exodus 24, 9 okay. to 11. Yeah, okay. All right, two they things. Two things, they... two things to consider here. One, we have to, if the Bible says that nobody can see God and live, right? But yet the Bible also says that people saw God and yet they lived. We have to be able to give a verbal defense of how that's possible. So we have to explain that dynamic. The second thing to consider, we have to understand what it means to see God in the second temple context, especially in the works of Philo. What does it mean to see God? The disciples said, show us the Father and that will be enough, right? The ultimate objective is to see the Father. No one has seen God who is the Father, but yet the Lagos has made the Father known. As I said a moment ago. Thank you. Statement. So you, you just ended up proving the Logos is a person that appears as God in the Old Testament and that speaks and can be spoken to. But earlier you said the Logos is not person. He's a rational principle. So why are you talking out of both sides of your mouth? I'm not. I'm, t- I'm speaking out of two sides of history. You're talking about what happened in the Old Testament. Then you're so talking about how here? people began to understand things under Hellenistic influence in that time period. Well, that you have to understand those. That's why I brought in my opening statement about the cultural context. You have to understand what things meant to them and how things began to be understood later on. Okay, Andrew, I know you keep talking to history, and I'm using history against you. So please, so the time, you don't eat it up. When Isaiah 6 verses 1 to 5 said, my eyes have seen Yahovah, Adonai, the King, the Lord of hosts. Was that the Logos that he saw? Because he didn't, he didn't say that he didn't see God visibly. He says, my eyes seen God. And he says he's got a robe uh, and he's on a throne. So he's seen God visibly. Who was that God that he saw in Isaiah 6 verses 1 to 5? Well, you have to explain the dynamic there. You have to understand how that began to be. Uh, how the people began to defend their faith on on the idea that nobody has seen God yet people saw God, and, and in the Second Temple period, which is right before the New Testament was written, people believed in mystical ascent, and to where they the the, the grand objective of mystical object? ascent was to see God, was to see the Father, okay. and what so they were seeing you? Him, but they were seeing Him through the logos and understanding in the incorporeal world. So you have to you understand. Notice again what you just said. You just again said that they saw God through the Logos. That means the Logos is the one who's appearing as God, speaking as God, whom they're worshiping as God. How can that be if the Logos is not a person? You see, again, you are speaking out of both sides of your mouth because the sources you're quoting don't teach that the Logos is depersonal. They say he is a person, 
a divine person distinct from God. That's why I challenge you to show me from Philo, where Philo says the Logos is not a person. You couldn't because he doesn't agree with you. So let me ask the question so you can answer it clearly. The Logos that they saw, Isaiah saw the Logos according to you. So I'll grant that. I'll go with that. Are you now saying the Logos is a person who can appear as God, be called God, and be worshipped as God? No. No? So then we're back to square one. Who did Isaiah see then? It says, my eyes have seen Jehovah. My the eyes Father. have seen the King of the hosts. The Father. But hold on. John 1.18 says, no one has seen God at any time apart from the Son. He saw so the Father true. through the Logos, but he, you got to understand, he didn't actually see God because nobody can actually see God and live. And that's and why these people were wrong. given. He says, I did see him. My eyes seen Jehovah. He says, so you're telling me that Isaiah didn't know what he's talking about because he said, my eyes have seen the King Jehovah of hosts. You don't get any plainer than this, friend. I mean, if you want to take it like that, and I understand the history, and, and be able to 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 be able to defend okay. the idea that nobody has seen God yet, people have seen God. Your, your argument is self-refuting. If the Bible says no one has seen God yet, something has made God known, and we have to understand okay. that what's making God known is not God Himself, because nobody has seen okay, God. So You're saying people have that. seen Jesus at some point, but yet nobody has seen God. So who did they okay, see? It was the Father through mystical ascent. Through the Logos, and you have to, you just, you keep talking you just about don't a, understand history. That's all that is. Okay, well, let's see if I don't understand. You keep talking about a mystical ascent, but in Exodus 24, there was an ascent. It was a descent. God came down on the mount. So I don't know why you keep talking about some mystical ascent from uninspired secondary sources when I'm going to the inspired text. In Exodus 24, did they ascend or did God descend? Did they go up or did God come down? You have to understand how that was explained prior okay. to the New Testament being, okay. being written. Okay, yeah, so if, if it, yeah. like like I said, does it seem to contradict? Maybe, but when you understand the dynamic and how it began to be explained prior to the New Testament written, everything makes sense. But if you don't understand that intertestament history, then nothing's going to make sense. It's going to appear okay. to contradict, but it does not. Let me let me let me challenge you on that. Two questions. Number one, can you show me in the intertestamental literature where the logos was considered simply an idea in the mind of God or rational principle and not a divine person? Quote that source that says he wasn't a person from the intertestamental literature. Yeah, well, one, I didn't say just the intertestament literature. Um, there's but, no way. Uh, right. uh, All right. I, uh, you know, there's no I, I go to your source, intertestament the literature, and then you backtrack. Okay. So, well, it, seem, it seems that you're doubting what I'm saying. It seems that you have full knowledge of what the intertestament literature is and that you're doubting what yes, I'm saying. I mean, my plan you. is to understand you, and then and I will respond later in full with everything, and I will back up everything I'm saying. I'm okay. just trying to later, get a feel for what your name. argument is. All right, that's time, fellas. That, that's time. That's time, fellas. All right, Andrew, you have your another ten minutes to cross examine Sam. Yeah. All right, sounds good. All right. So, uh, picking up a little bit on what we were just talking about, you, you agreed all throughout the New Testament and, and in the Old Testament that that it says that no one has seen God. That no, because you can't see God and live, right? That's that's a clear no, statement in the Old Testament, you're right? Not the way you're understanding it. No, give me a verse. Go to verse so I can deal with it. Okay. Give me a verse. Uh, uh, look, let, let's deal with the with the New Testament. You agree in the New Testament that it says no one has seen God. God it says it right there in the prologue. No one has seen God at any time. No, finish it. It didn't say what you said. Apart yeah, from no, the no, no, no. It does say that. It does say that. We'll get to this second part. Okay, I'm just asking you if you agree that in the prologue, right in the prologue, it says no one has seen God at any time. No, it doesn't Do you agree say that. With that? No. It doesn't me, say that? Can I answer you now or you want to cut me off? Let let's, me allow, no, let's, just, a, let's allow him to answer. No, you're misreading it like you did with John 5.27. Finish the verse. No one can see God apart from the Son revealing uh, yeah. it. I'm, go, I'm, going, I'm, going to, I'm going to finish the verse. I'm can going I to finish, finish the verse, but there's a, there's a 
first part of the verse. Okay. I, just, I want to deal with the first part before we get to the second part. I there don't want to no deal with the second part, part afterwards. Second part. What I'm saying is that right, I'm, I got my Bible clear as day. Part. John 1.18, it says, no one has ever seen God. Finish it. It is it. the unique son who is close to the father that has made God known. Thank you for refuting yourself. Meaning I you can't be God by the agency of the son, which was my point. Who is the God that they're seeing in the Old Testament? If you don't read your Unitarianism into the text and butcher it, then the God they saw was Jesus because Jesus was alive and active in the Old Testament, something you deny. So this right. passage is your nightmare. Okay, so when it so when it says that no one has seen God, what you're saying is that actually they did. If you have a if if you don't have another question, then we're just spinning wheels here because that's not no, what the I, text. I'm, I'm asking you a question. Please answer the question. What what I'm saying is that Let when, when John one eighteen says that finish? no one has seen God, what you're saying is that they actually have. Because the rest of the verse says, the Son revealed him, meaning you can see God because of the Son, by the agency of the Son, through the Son. What don't you get? The English, it's not clear. I go to the Greek, you don't know Greek. Do you want me to read in Swahili or Afrikaans? The verse doesn't say what you're saying. Finish it. The first part is, no one can see God, but the Son has revealed him, meaning... When you do see God, that's because the Son is revealing Him to you. It's not saying you can't see God at all. That's not what it says. Finish it. It's right in front of you in English. No one has okay, seen God at all. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish. Known. Okay. I'm, so that I'm going to finish. To the I'm, point, trying, I'm trying to finish. The God that's, that they I, saw that was, in the Old just, Testament is Jesus Christ, which you can't accept because then you're going to admit that your doctrine is a doctrine of demons. So repent and accept the true God. There's... There's no shame in being wrong. Repent and accept Jesus as God Almighty, your creator and savior. It's not about winning a debate. It's about showing your doctrine is a doctrine of devils. Let me be honest with you. Because you can't let the Bible uh, speak. You've got to go. distort it like other cults do. No one can see God apart from the Son. That means when they saw God, they were seeing Jesus. That's the point of the debate. But go ahead. What's your next question? You said, you said that Jesus has made God known. But he didn't make that's himself. What but that, that's okay. All right, that's okay. No, that's what one eighteen there, said. That's what one eighteen said. There, there, there's the Sam we know right there. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, Ed Hamid. Okay, you can attack me. That's fine. Everyone is no, seeing no, the you, truth. No, the you're, you're down. saying that I have a. You're saying that I have a doctrine of demons, and then now it you. It is. Want, now okay. Want let's let's topic. let's make sure we stay on topic. Let's not veer off topic, and uh, we want to keep the let's keep the comments and questions and answers directly towards the topic of this debate. What's the next question? Go ahead. Next question. Yes. All right. Jesus clearly tells us in the Gospel of John that he has a God. Okay. So you do you agree with that? That Jesus tells just just a just a yes or no answer. If I can give you a yes or no answer, I will. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So okay. do you so do you believe that Jesus was Aware or unaware that he was God? Of course he's aware that he's God. He says that all throughout the Gospel of John. Okay, thank you for the simple answer. It's going to make a lot more productive debate. Well, some questions can be simple. Some I need to go in depth. I can't just give you pat answers. Sure. Sure, but I, I've specifically designed my questions just to be really short and to the point. But I understand. Um, I understand what you're saying. I'm not, you're I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to set no, you up or catch you. And to trick, and Andrew, trick everybody. Not, I'm just like trying you. to get an honest answer from you and, and walk you through the reasoning process, my reasoning oh, okay. process. All right, go ahead. I like you, man. Don't worry about it. So go ahead. All right, good. So Jesus is fully conscious that he is God, but, mm -hmm. but yet says repeatedly that he has a God. Why would that be a contradiction if Jesus? No, no, no. Is not I'm not. No, I'm just following. Okay. Is that, so with that, right. so make sure we're, I'm, we're on the same page, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're well, saying that he was fully that. aware that he was God, but yes. at the same, while he was fully conscious that yeah. he was God, he also said as he has a God, right? We're yeah. on the same page. Yeah, but uh, I need to explain. I can't, you know. So if you want me to just say yes, no, 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 yes no. it's just a yes or no, and then I'm going to ask you one more it's question. Not really yes or no, but yes. 
Okay, it's not a yes or no, but yes, good, because I want you to get your point so I can then unpack it. Right. Yes. Right. I understand. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you explain everything. I'm just we're just walking through the reasoning process right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Sure. All right. So when Jesus says that he has a God, mm -hmm. is he is he just acting out? Is he acting like is he does he know he's God, but he's just telling people that he has a God, sort of acting out a role, or or does he? Is, what's going on there? There. Okay, so now I can unpack the answer? Yes, please. Okay, uh, because it's not simply Jesus knows he's God. He also knows he's the God-man, God who became flesh. And by becoming flesh, he realizes that his Father becomes his God. Why do I say that? Now let me give you my reasoning from Scripture, not Second Temple Judaism when it contradicts the Bible. Jeremiah thirty-two twenty-seven: Behold, I am the Lord, Yahweh, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? The God of all flesh. Now, we go back to John 1.14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So if I, I, if I let the Bible speak and I apply biblical logic, Yahweh is the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The Son, the Word, became flesh, not the Father. He became flesh to be the servant of the Father. From the moment the Word becomes flesh, the Father, whom He now serves, on earth as a man, becomes His God. So Jesus is fully aware. I am the Logos, the Son of God, one with the Father in essence, but I'm also human. And I'm human to serve the Father, and because I became flesh, the Father has become my God. Where's the problem? Yeah, that's right. So, so he's saying he knows he's the God man. So he's essentially just, according to your theology, he's, he's sort of just acting out a part. I mean, he knows he's God, but he's telling these people, "Look, I like I'm I like I know I'm a man, but I'm sort of going to act like I'm going to my God." So these people, you know, what what. I mean, that's that's what I'm getting, but you, you, you okay, understand my you reasoning know. process and how I see things, how I do? No, no, I see that you're trying hard to evade the clear teaching of Scripture because you're committed to your Unitarianism because everyone hears the logic of the Scripture. There's nothing acting out. Jesus is truly God in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit in essence. So when you keep saying acting out, Jesus is not acting out anything. He is man and he's God, and he realizes that as God, he's the son of the father. As man, when he becomes flesh, the father becomes his God. So it's not either or, it's both and, and that's the teaching of the New Testament. The word who is God, one with the father, distinct from the father, becomes flesh. When he becomes flesh, the father becomes his, his God, and he's fully aware of it on earth. That's why the Bible affirms he's the God man. The son of God, one with the father in essence, can do the things that only God can do, but he's truly human. Where's the problem if I let the Bible speak? Uh, the, the problem that I see is that he's, the, he's, you're saying he's fully conscious that he's God, but yet he's yeah. saying that he has a God, so he has to be aware that he's God, but yet he's telling people that he has a God. And so what, are you saying that okay. sort of like his human he's nature has a God? Yeah. Or he's like, also fully aware or, that he's human, and he's fully aware that when he becomes human, to serve his father, the father becomes his God. So again, you keep trying to create a dichotomy and a dilemma when none exists. So exactly. yes, he also knows he's fully human. And he knows because he became flesh, the father becomes his God, even though he's one with the father in essence. Okay? Ben? That's, it. Yeah, that's your answer, right? That's the biblical answer. I, mean, I just gave you the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. A, a biblical answer according, according to Sam. Okay, if it's according to me, that's fine, man. Whatever it is, I'm just telling you. I just quoted the verses. All right, what's the next question? You have another one? Yeah. Um, yeah. You, okay, All right, that's so... that's time right there. That's time right there. All right, Sam, you are up for your final 10-minute cross-examination of Andrew. All right, Andrew, we're going to go to John 8, and we're going to walk through this slowly, if you don't mind. So I'm going to read it, John 8. I may even take my entire 10 minutes just on John 8, okay? In John 8, I'm going to read for you from, uh, let me see. I want to see where I should start with, with this. Okay, hold on. Okay. Um, let's start. Let's go to John 8. We're going to read 39 all the way to 41. Because it's a long chapter, but you'll see where I'm going with this when we look at it. So let me read it for you. I'm going to read it slowly. Okay. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus is now in a debate with Jews who thought they were his disciples, but now are questioning his sanity. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me, a man, see he's a man, he knows he's a man, 
was told you the truth which I heard from God. Okay, Abraham did not do this. You are doing the works of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, God. So let me repeat the part that I want you to answer for me. He's showing them that you don't really belong to Abraham. Though you are his physical children, you don't truly belong to him because you don't behave like him, you don't act like him. Here's the proof. You're trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. So Andrew, what did Abraham not do? He's contrasting Abraham with these Jews. You're trying to kill me. Abraham didn't try to do this. What didn't Abraham try to do to Jesus? What verse are you at? John 8, 39 to 41, but specifically verse 40. But John 8, 39 to 41, specifically verse 40. You're trying to kill me, a man who has told you the things he heard from God. Abraham did not do this, didn't try to do this. Abraham didn't try to do what? Uh, Abraham did not try to kill the messenger. I would say Abraham does not didn't try to kill the messenger who told him that he was going to have a son. That's not what Jesus said in verse 40. Read it again. You're trying to kill me, something Abraham did not try to do. It's right there. You're importing words that are not in the passage. No, it's, he says the truth. You're trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Yep. Abraham did not do this. Abraham did not do what? It's in the context. Don't import things that are not in the context. What did Abraham not do? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I try to follow where you're going with this. Maybe if you can get to the point, and I can under, I can answer your Quite question. Quite clearly, now. and this is going to come to the second part of my question. Quite clearly, Jesus is saying, "Here's proof you have nothing to do, Abraham. You're trying to kill me. Abraham didn't try to kill me. So let me ask you a question. How could Jesus say Abraham didn't try to kill him when Abraham had been dead for two thousand years when Jesus made that statement? That's the clear implication of the text. There's no getting around it. I'm not adding anything or taking away. You're the one who has to import an alien context into the words. I, I, I would have to I would have to check the context. It's a good question. Um, but but here's the thing. What what he's what it says is a, a man who told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham didn't kill the messenger who, who told him the truth that he heard from God. Where does Again, it say God, is, God is the God is the God is the origin of the message. The messenger is the servant who delivers the message. Okay, so the origin is, is, is God is the origin of the message. Whoever told Abraham, whatever he told him, yeah. spoke the words of God just as Jesus did. Abraham didn't try to kill the messenger of God, yeah. Andrew, but they're trying to kill the messenger of God. Yeah. I got your point, and I'm not trying to be rude to cut you off, but I don't want you to eat my time. You did it again. There's nothing in the verse that speaks of Abraham not trying to kill messengers. It's about Jesus and why the Jews do not truly belong to Abraham because the way they're reacting to Jesus. You're trying to kill me. Abraham didn't try to kill me, proving you have no connection with Abraham, which brings me to the second part of the passage, John 8, 56 to 59. This should make it more clearer to you because now remember Andrew, he said, here's proof you have nothing to do with Abraham. You're trying to kill me. Abraham didn't try to kill me. Now let me prove to you that's what Jesus is saying. Abraham did not try to kill Jesus. His reaction was different. John 8, 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. You see you Jews? You see me, you angry, you want to kill me. Your father saw me and was glad. Now notice what they ask him, how they understood his words. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? Man, that, that's a logical question. Abraham's been dead for 2,000 years, Jesus. You're not yet 50. What do you mean Abraham rejoiced to see you? You seen him? And Jesus doesn't say what you say. Truly, truly, I say to you, I existed as a plan in God's mind revealed to Abraham. So Abraham knew I was coming because I was a plan in God's mind, and he, he knew the plan. No, no. He explains, yes, I did see him. Because truly, truly, I say to you, unlike Abraham who came into being, I am. Yes, I saw him because Abraham came into being, but I've always been. So Andrew, can you explain to me how does this make sense in light of your Unitarianism where Jesus says, unlike you Jews who are trying to kill me, Abraham saw me, didn't try to kill me, but was happy to see me. And yes, I did see him because unlike Abraham, I've been around before his birth and I remain till the present moment. How does that comport with your Unitarianism? Uh, because you're not reading the verse uh, correctly. Uh, what he says again. is that your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. 
he saw it and was glad. It doesn't say he saw me on that day. It well, says he, he would see my day. The day is the, the coming of the Messiah when people well, read would be saved. And the... Read 57, which refutes you. I already anticipated your objection. Read 57, yeah, which refutes you. Yeah, okay. The, the, so what you so your basic argument is that the Jews understood what he was saying, but yet Jesus says early in the verse that, why don't you understand anything that I'm saying? Your father is the yes, devil, they, and that's why yes. you don't understand me. You know, what, question. what they say yes. is, like, here, here goes, I, I got to finish. I got to be able to finish. Okay, go ahead, All right, go ahead, go ahead. So, so they say to him, you're not 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham. They, these guys don't understand what he's saying. They're, in, in a lot of ways, they're kind of like, they're kind of airheads. You know, John presents these Jewish authorities as airheads because Jesus said they saw my day, and they're saying, "Oh, you saw Abraham." So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of ignorant statement. They're not understanding okay, what Jesus is saying, question? and Jesus explains why they're point. not understanding what he's saying okay. uh, earlier. No, in but the I got your point, Andrew. Before my time is up, I got your point. They misunderstood him. That means you're not reading again. Fifty-eight. He doesn't correct him. He doesn't say. He doesn't say in fifty-eight. Read fifty-eight. He doesn't say, "No, guys, you're not getting my point. You're not understanding my words." He actually shows them they're right. Because before Abraham came into being, I am. He shows they understood him correctly, and he explains why. Don't let my physical appearance deceive you. I'm older than 50. I was there before Abraham came into being. So, Andrew, if you just pay attention to context, you get the refutation to your own argument. Yes, they misunderstood him in certain times, but here they understood him correctly because Jesus didn't say, you didn't understand what I'm saying? Abraham saw a prophecy of my coming. No, no, no. Unlike your father Abraham who came into being, I am. I did see him because I've been around even before his existence. So please let the text speak. Don't read your Unitarianism into the text. Explain how this could be possible if your view of Jesus is right. Well, what, which part? I mean, which part? The John so... he doesn't say what you said. Let me repeat it again. He doesn't say, you guys are not getting it. I'm not saying I actually saw Abraham. Abraham just received the revelation that the Messiah would come, the day of the Messiah. No, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unlike Abraham came into being, I am. So that's a statement. He did see him because he was there before he was created, because he was around, alive, consciously and personally. So he doesn't say they misunderstood him. He corrects their misunderstanding that he's but 50 years old. In other words, the Jews thought like you. They thought Jesus was just a man. So you with the Jews are wrong, and Jesus is refuting you because the Jews had okay. your belief. This is just a man. So, so, so right. you're essentially saying that the Jews did understand him. Because Jesus says, yes, I did see him. Okay. You're right on there that point. Yes, there read we, it. Yeah, so, so that's where our, there's our disagreement is that, that I believe the that disagreement? they didn't exactly. understand it because in verse 56, he says, your, Abraham, your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw yeah. it. He saw my day. It doesn't say he saw me on that day. It says he saw my day, speaking of the future day of the Messiah. They didn't understand okay. him. So Jesus responds in verse 58. And we can go over that if you'd like. But our basic disagreement boils down to you believe that the Jews understood Jesus. And I believe that they misunderstood him. No. Let me let me correct you. what you just imputed to me. I didn't say the Jews always understood Jesus. When they're wrong, he no, no, corrects right, them. Just there. What I said, yes, but let me let me finish the one. What I said here was he didn't correct them like you are correcting me. He didn't say, no, I didn't see Abraham. Abraham saw the coming of Messiah. That's what I mean. Why didn't Jesus simply correct them? Why did he say, before Abraham came into being, I am, meaning I've been there and I remain till this day. So I did see him. His answer is, yes, I did see him. Why can't you just accept what Jesus says? Why are you fighting against Jesus? Uh, I'm not fighting against Jesus. You're imposing on the text what you believe Jesus okay. should have responded with in that situation. If you no, would like to your get to John 8:58 and have a All okay. right, that's time. That, that's time right there. All right, uh, Andrew, you are up for your final 10 minute cross examination of Sam. All right, so let's let's try to get into John 17 just to make things interesting. I know you oh, wanted really? to go there. All right, and, and so um, yeah, let's not. Yeah, because I mean, uh, we can have a separate conversation on that, but you know, you do what like, you want. Um, no not really, not not really, not really much to say. I mean, let's let's just go to stick on John 8:58. 
Sure. All right. I don't Ask. know if you have a Bible in front of you right now. If we go to John eight fifty six, can I, can I you read, it to you, read yeah. uh, maybe we maybe we have different translations and maybe that's where the problem is. Can you read what to translation are you reading, us, Andrew? John, eight, what translation you read? are you reading? Oh, I, what I, I can read like anyone you want. Currently, right now, I have a new revised Standard Edition. Okay, let me let me turn there. I'm gonna use your own translation. Hold on, let me get there. Okay, go ahead. I'm using and your can translation. You, can you just read? Can, can you read to us John eight, 8 fifty six? Sure. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Mm -hmm. So, so what is my day? It means when God. Jesus would appear to him and make himself known that he is his God. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, okay. Can you guys hear me? But in, in this context, what, what is my day? Yeah. In the context, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The context from verse 40 down is Jesus appearing to him and making himself known to be his God, El Shaddai. I'm not denying, I, by I, the way, just let me make, I'm not denying that Abraham was was given a revelation of the Messiah to come. I do believe God revealed to him the coming of the Messiah. I'm saying contextually, in the context, in verse 40, and then <clears throat> light of 57 to 59, Jesus saying, Abraham rejoiced to see his God appear to him and reveal himself to him, which he did because the God who appeared to him was Jesus Christ. That's the point of John 1.18. So, so what you're saying is that the my day there is not referring to the coming of Jesus. It was it's referring to a past event. Is that what you're saying? No, it, it can be both and. In other words, it can refer to Jesus appearing to him as God and making known to him that he would come to be Israel's Messiah. It doesn't have to be either or. It's both and. But definitely, so, definitely, it includes Jesus appearing to him personally because that's what the Jews said. You've seen Abraham, and he goes, "Yes, I have." Unlike you, Abraham didn't try to kill me. Yep. Uh, what What happens to your theology if you find out that my day refers to a future event? Or for, for instance, it says, uh, your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that, uh, that he would see my day. He saw mm -hmm. it. So it is, is, you're saying it, there is more than one single event, more than one no. single, quote, day. No, what I'm saying is, Contextually, the day must necessarily include the day in which God made himself known to Abraham. That is unavoidable why? in the context. Why? Why? I uh, told you why. Do you want to repeat it again? Okay. Let me repeat it again. Are you going to no, okay, say why is because the question that the Jews asked him after that? No, I mean, you want me to make my case for me or you want to make it for me? Can I make it? No, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. You because said it. We're has reading up to your include that past day. I'm just asking why. Go ahead. Okay. Because of the context. Let's start at the context. That's why I walked you through it from verse 40. Let's try it again. I'm going to use the new Revised Standard Version this time. John 8, 39 to 40. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do be doing what Abraham did. Act like him. And what did Abraham do? But now you're trying to kill me a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. Abraham did not try to kill me. So that's the first part of the context. Then we go on later, and then he explains Abraham's reaction, unlike their reaction. So you're trying to kill me. You're saying I'm demon-possessed. You hate me. You're trying to kill me. Ah, but your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. See, what more proof do you need that you are not truly Abraham's children? Because you're not reacting to me the way he did. You're trying to kill me. He was happy to see me. And then to put the icing on the cake. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? You saw Abraham? And Jesus didn't say what you said. Why don't you understand my words? How come it doesn't sink in? Why are you always misunderstanding me? What's wrong with you? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Yes. You know why I could see him? Because unlike Abraham, who came into being, the Greek verb, genestai, means to come into being, I am, mean, meaning I was there before he came into being. I was there when he came into being. I remain after he died up to the present. Yeah. Wait for the buffering to go. Hold on. The buffering, it's still buffering. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. All right, it looked like it came back on my side. Yeah, but then it buffered again. See, even people are saying buffering. Keep an eye on the YouTube channel, Marlon. All right, no problem.
Okay. Go ahead, ask the question. Sorry, guys, that's beyond our control. Go ahead, Andrew, and give him some more time. If you want, give him – you can take more time than 10. Don't worry about it. I don't, I don't mind. I'm, I'm generous. Go ahead. All right. So, so, the, so your basic argument is that the, the my, my day in verse 56 has to include a previous uh, visitation of Jesus to Abraham because you're referring back to uh, uh, John 8, 38 and 39. And 40, right? Is that the basic yeah. argument? Yeah, well, that's part of it. And then oh. verses 57, 59, the whole, yes. Uh -huh. All right. And and so, and, and then, and then, so just to conclude, so you're saying that the Jews actually understood what Jesus was saying in, in 57? Yes, because he then confirms, yes, you're right. I saw him, and here's why. Before he came into being, I've always been. I've been there and I continue he, to be. He doesn't say. The answer is right he doesn't there, say. I don't know what, 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 what he does. What he does is says uh, an enigmatic statement, and that's why I brought up. Uh, you know what? Enigmatic. So define I enigmatic. Define uh, it's enigmatic. It's hard to understand. It's difficult to under. It's difficult to understand. Why? It's not difficult for me. You have to make it difficult because it doesn't yeah. agree with your Unitarianism. No, no. I'm just saying. I mean, it's fine. It, <laughs> okay. It it's uh, b before Abraham was I am. But that doesn't that's not a clear English statement that that has to take some breaking down to understand what's being said and we have to understand you want to break the it down? dynamic I can. within all the context that we talked about. But just we can move on but the thing is your basic I'll argument you. is that uh, 57 when he says my day has to include a previous visitation because John, uh, Jesus brought up in uh, what he said in, in verses 39 through uh, 40 or 38 through 40 and then in verse 57 the Jews actually understood what he was saying and so they asked him yeah, what he was saying you're spinning wheels there Andrew you know that right because you're repeating the same thing that I've answered over and over again you want to go to another question yeah, no, I'm just making it I'm just making it I'm just making it clear yeah and uh and yeah. I mean uh all right and so uh, when when Jesus was Jesus was in heaven Right. Let's let's imagine Jesus is in heaven. He's with God. Let's assume that he mm -hmm. eternally existed. Okay. Um, okay. Was was Jesus sent from heaven, or did he did he, did he voluntarily go? Uh, why do you make it assume like it's either or? Uh, again, your questions are baffle me. He was sent by the Father, which he gladly, willfully accepted, because there's no competition in the Godhead. Where they fight with one another, argue with one another, yeah. and Jesus so throws the tantrum. So right. I don't so understand the nature. Let's let's, let's 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 really let's really pay attention to what you're saying here. Okay, you're saying he both uh, went uh, and he he was both sent and, and he volunteered to go. Now, you don't see yes. that 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 you don't. You, well, I don't know why I'm saying is I could understand how why it's baffling because I because you don't understand uh, the, the the difference between someone being sent and then voluntarily going like if if i send my wife to the store and i say you're going to the store and i send her she yeah. didn't voluntarily go i sent her she could make up her mind whether or not she wants to go but i did i sent her to the store to do something okay and and, and your wife can say i'm not going go to hell right she could yeah. say that but if she is a good woman who fears the lord and honors you she goes it's it i'll be too happy to go because it's my pleasure to carry out your will because I love you. Where's the problem? Okay, so, so, but she has the choice. So what you're saying is that Jesus had the cho choice to disobey the Father. No, because the Godhead never disagree and never act contrary to one another because they are uh, perfect know. unlike you and me. Let me finish the answer because your, your question doesn't lead to the conclusion you're seeking to make. The Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit are not fallen imperfect creatures. They are perfect in their fellowship, communion, and love for one another, and they delight to glorify the other, and they delight to serve the other. So this is, again, a false dichotomy, a false dilemma of your own making. So unless you have another question, your point is not anything. I haven't even finished yet. Just getting started. Okay, to get to your point. And, and so what I'm saying is what you said, let's examine again what you're saying, because what you're saying is that they never disagree, right? But then you're saying that, they don't do they even have the potential to disagree so do you understand the difference between not, not doing something and having the potential to not do it well i'm answering your question can i answer 
unless you believe God has the potential to sin but chooses not to, I believe in a God who is immutable by nature and cannot act contrary to his nature, to his goodness, to his love, to his holiness. And to prove your point that Jesus came voluntarily and not wasn't compelled, John 10, 17, 18. So let's go to the Bible. Same John that you're quoting, John 10, 17, 18. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Wait, Jesus, how can you say your own accord if you're sent? Don't you understand the Unitarian logic? If you're sent, it can't be of your own accord. See, Jesus refutes your logic. Your logic is not biblical. It's man-made, imposed on the text to distort the text. And notice what he says. That's why my father loves me. Because I came of my own accord. He didn't have to compel me and force me. There is no contradiction. It's not either or. It's both and, according to the Bible. Let the Bible speak. Yeah, he was happy to do it. But the question is, did he have the potential him. not to do it? That's that's the question. We're, no. just, we're talking about potential. No. So, you, this does not assume potentiality because the Godhead is perfect and they delight to serve and honor and glorify one another. It's like when Jesus said, the spirit of truth will glorify me. They are not like you and me, fallen imperfect creatures in competition with each other. They are perfect divine persons who perfectly love one another and cannot act independently from the other. All right, so let's go back know, to where I'm starting. So again, we're imagining God and Jesus in heaven, right? And what I'm asking you is, no, no, was, Jesus they were sent, was, was Jesus sent by the Father? And did Jesus say, I came of my own accord, and that's why the Father loves me? John 10, 17, 18. Yes, both are true. So what's your next question? Okay. Uh, um. Okay, so you're saying that Jesus says that I came on my own accord? I didn't say that. I just read it to you. I read it in your own translation, New Revised Standard Version. You want me to quote another translation? Here, let me read it again. John no, he, 10, says, 7, he says, I lay down my life of my own accord. What, what, how, the reason how did he, the how, did he lay down his God me. life as, okay. on his own accord? The that, reason that's, the father, you, can the I context the is answer? him as a human being right there. Okay. Yeah. The reason the Father loves me is because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. Unless you believe... That part of God's plan for the Son wasn't to die, you're again splitting hairs. Because what God sent Jesus to do was to die. And he says, I died of my own accord. That's part of his mission, unless you're denying it's part of his mission. I want you to tell everyone, the sending of the Son did include him dying for us. Say that. I want it on record that you're denying it. Well, what you're saying is say that, 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 that God, as before he you became know, what incarnate... I say it on the record. It wasn't part of God's mission to send Jesus to die. That was not part of the sending. So everyone can see you're splitting hairs, and you can't deal with the exegesis of the passage. Say it. No, that didn't Same. include the sending. The sending part didn't include the dying. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're saying that he – are you saying – maybe you're breaking up. Are you saying he was sent to die or was not sent to die? Of course he was sent to die, but you made the false dichotomy. This passage doesn't talk about sending. It talks about him laying down his life. Well, all, all, I'm asking you, all I'm asking you is that while Jesus was in heaven, was he sent, yes or no? Jesus was sent, and he gladly came down, not by compulsion, but of his own accord, because he delights to do the Father's will. I don't know how many times. You want me to say it in a different way, in a different language? Maybe that will be clear. Do you want me to say it in Assyrian? I just want to. I just want a yes or no. All right, that's Was time. Sent, yes or no. Thank you. That's that's time right there. All right, fellas, great dis <laughs> great discussion. Another fiery one, man. Um, what's up with you, the Terry? Man, coming over here and create wreaking havoc, create havoc. Uh, Andrew, what's going on, man? <laughs> yeah. No, nah, great discussion, fellas. I appreciate y'all both, man. Great cross-examination portion. All right, now we're transitioning to our closing statements. We have about a five-minute closing. Um, everyone out there, if you have your questions, get those questions in now. Uh, get them in now because after the closing statements, we will have Q&A. So get those questions in. All right, Sam, you're up for a five-minute closing. All right, all glory to Yahweh Jesus, the eternal Son, who is one with the Father and the Spirit, for a mighty victory in anointing me to speak truth for his glory, honor, and praise, and letting the scriptures testify to him being the perfect God man. We love you, Lord Jesus. As you can see in this discussion, Andrew wasn't able to deal with any of the arguments that I set forth from not just the prologue, 
but from what John taught in the context of John. For example, I began my discussion by saying that John the Baptist is identified as the Shaliach, the agent sent to prepare for the coming of Yahweh God. He wasn't an agent sent to prepare for the coming of another agent. He was the agent of God sent for God's appearance, appearing whose glory would see. And guess what? According to John's gospel, that Yahweh God, whose glory John and others beheld, was none other than Jesus Christ, establishing that Jesus is God in the gospel of John, and not a God, but Yahweh God, the God of Isaiah. I also demonstrated that according to John chapter 1, verse 18, that no one can see God at any time, which includes the sacred history of the Old Testament apart. Yeah, wait, this way, let it clear up. Sorry. All right. Yeah. All right. Look okay, like now I'm came. back. Yeah, look, I came back. Okay, let me just try this way. So, yeah, if you just, yeah, if whatever seconds it took. Sorry, guys. Okay. So, All maybe right, no you problem. can add a few seconds. All right. I'll, I'll take Sorry, care of you, Sam. I got you. Okay, glory to the triune God. I was saying, we read in John, Genesis 17, verse 1 and 22. Oops, it froze on me. Okay, sorry guys. John 17, verse 1 and 22, we read that Yahweh appeared to Abraham, not an, an agent of Yahweh, and he said, I am El Shaddai. We read in John, Genesis 12, 7, in Genesis 18, Yahweh God is appearing, not an agent, and he's appearing to Abraham, and Abraham realizes that's God and calls him God and worship, worships him as God. In Exodus 24, verses 9, 9 to 11, it says, Moses... Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, 70 elders, saw the God of Israel. It didn't say we saw his agent, his Shaliach. We saw the God of Israel. And we saw what looked like pavement under his feet. So he even had feet, a visible form. And they saw God and ate and drank in his presence. Isaiah 6, it says that he saw Yahweh, the king, Yahweh host, with his eyes. My eyes have seen Yahweh of hosts. My eyes have seen Adonai, the king. Not his Shaliach. Not an agent on the throne, but God Almighty in visible form on his throne. But John 1.18 told us, no one can see God apart from the Son. So since the Bible doesn't contradict, what more do you want John to tell us that Jesus was active in Old Testament history, revealing God to the patriarchs and the prophets because they would not be able to see God visibly had it not been for Jesus. That means the God they beheld is Jesus who then gives us access to the Father. You can't get around the plain teaching of John 1.18. And then we went to John 8, 39 to 41 and 56 to 59. And what do we see there? We saw that Jesus says to the Jews, you don't truly belong to Abraham. Because if you, believe that, if you belong to Abraham, you would believe like him and act like him and respond to me the way he did. You're trying to kill me, something Abraham did not do. But hold on, Jesus, Abraham's been dead for 2,000 years. How could you say that Abraham did not try to kill you? Later on, he explains, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it was glad. And the Jews then reasoned, Wait, you're not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? And Jesus didn't sound like a Unitarian, but the Jews sounded like a Unitarian because they assumed like the Unitarian, Jesus is only a man, nothing more, nothing less. And glory to God for John 8 because that is the annihilation of Unitarianism. No, I am no mere man. I'm more than a man. I've been there before Abraham was created. I am the God of Abraham, and I'm the God of you Unitarians, and you need to repent and worship me as God and not rob me of my glory and blaspheme my dignity. Then another point that I made. I demonstrated that in John 1, 1, 2, the phrase pros tan theon, the preposition pros, is used elsewhere in the Gospel of John, specifically in John 13, verse 3, and John 16, 25 to 31. What made John 16, 25 and 31 massively <clears throat> important in this discussion? Jesus says, I'm speaking plainly, not figuratively. And I am plainly telling you, I came from the Father into the world. I'm leaving the world, going to the Father. Even Andrew admitted the going to the Father was actual. He went there actually as a person to have face and face to face communion. But the first part he allegorizes. Why would you allegorize the first part, but take the second part as actual, personal going? What grounds do you split a passage in half, allegorize one part, part, but accept the other statement literally, especially when the disciple said, you're speaking plainly. And because you're speaking plainly, we know you know everything, you're omniscient, and you came from God. John could not be any clearer. Jesus personally existed with the Father, came down personally into the world to become flesh, and went back personally to the Father, but this time as embodied 
spirit as an embodied person with a physical body who's God in the flesh. And interestingly, it uses the preposition pros. I'm going to the Father. Pros, ta, patera. You don't get any clearer from the Gospel of John. Jesus is Yahweh God of the Old Testament, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of Isaiah, the God who appeared throughout Old Testament history, the God that John the Baptist was sent to prepare for, the God of Isaiah 40, whom John the Baptist was his shaliach. So John the Baptist was the agent of Yahweh Jesus who became flesh. So the Yahweh of the Old Testament is now known as the historical Jesus of Nazareth. Distinct from the Father and the Spirit, but one with them in essence, glory, power, and majesty. That's all right, the Sam. Jesus. Amen. All right, all right, Sam, that's up. Time is up. All right, Andrew, you have five minutes to go ahead and uh, give a closing statement. All right. Oh, where do we start? Where do we start? Um, all right. So, you know, um, what the thing that's that's missing here that I can't really I can't really be upset with Sam here and I can't really be upset with Trinitarians here is that respectfully modern Trinitarians are ignorant of intertestament history. Now, I don't mean that they're ignorant people. That's far from the truth. People far smarter than me. I'm sure uh, Sam has a brain capacity. They call him the Assyrian Encyclopedia. right? But what I'm saying is that they're ignorant of a certain period of history that is fundamental to understanding what comes in the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John. Okay? All of the church fathers knew who Philo was, right? Does not Justin Martyr call the Lagos or Jesus the a second God? And mention Philo in his apology, he does. All right, so a lot of Trinitarians get caught up in this. I have to warn you, they, they say things like he possesses the full divine essence. But nobody I've ever talked to can actually explain what that means. So you're caught up in extra biblical language that that doesn't uh, that doesn't mean anything to anybody because the person who claims it can't even define what it is. So how is the person you're explaining it to supposed to understand what it is? Okay, we talk about um, oh man and. Uh, uh, so how how can things be taken figuratively? How can it be that Jesus is from above here and yet he's ascending to God, God here? And how why is it not the same? Okay, because as I mentioned in my opening statement, John's gospel was understood to be a spiritual gospel, and we have to understand not only the intertestament literature. You have to understand what John is saying himself, what John understood, what is most likely the context. John said what he said in John 3 Jesus talks about being born from all right I, I heard something but uh, Jesus the, the Nicodemus says rabbi we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God and, and Jesus goes in to talk about being born from above of, and these things were already talked about in Philo. These things are already talked about. The, this is not a new concept yet, but when we read the New Testament, we're comp we don't understand where this comes from. We don't understand well, how is the Lagos with God and the Lagos is Theos. But this was already talked about prior to from the original Lagos theorist. All the other ones butchered it. Philo was the greatest. Philo was also a Platons, we can't be afraid of Platonism. Philosophy is good. Philosophy is great when it's in tune with what the Bible teaches. Right? Understanding that the, what is in, expressed in Christ is the pinnacle of philosophy and the things that we should understand. But we have to understand when we have these debates, why do we have why is it important we understand this? Because ultimately it's how we perceive reality. If I say to you, show me God, you can't do it. 
but we know and all apologists explain God because there's a rational order in the universe. That's what we can understand about God. We can't see God, but we can understand the Logos. The Logos is how we know God is. And the Logos was dwelt in Jesus, and Jesus continues to tell us how God is. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Not, not when you've seen me, you've seen me. Not when you've seen me, you've seen God the Son. Why wouldn't he? The Father alone is God. According, according to Philo, according to Philo, God was to'on. He was the one existing, the one being. The Logos is secondary to that. The Logos is what made the supreme God known. Exodus 3.14 says, Ego and me, O on. I am the one who is. That is God. That is Yahweh. Jesus is, and the Logos is what makes that God known, who is the Father alone. All right, and you see a clear contradiction, but we have to understand the dynamic. How is it that people, how is it said that nobody can see God and live? How is it all through the Old Testament that no one has seen God, yet somehow people saw God somehow, in some manner, some shape or manner, and yet in the prologue itself, no one has seen God. So quick, no one has seen God. People saw Jesus. Jesus is not God. We have to understand the dynamic, the logos, the rational principle and moral order of the universe is how God is known. And that is what is often synonymous with wisdom. And it's said to dwell in Jesus. It was said to, wisdom was said to dwell with the Israelites, right? But no one received wisdom, so it went back up to the throne by God. Yet wisdom came as a man in the person of Jesus and was rejected, quote, by his own, by the so-called Jews, religious authorities, people who misunderstood things, people who were in the flesh, people who could not understand the spiritual realm. God is spirit. The Father is looking for those to worship him in spirit and truth. The Father is alone God. All right, that's time right there. <clears throat> All right, thank you both for this debate, yeah. man. Another awesome one in the books, man. So I appreciate both of you guys for yeah. doing your thing, man, um, yeah. and fighting through everything, the buffering and the technical difficulties. So I appreciate you both. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and go to the Q&A portion of this debate. Um, so we have a whole bunch of questions for you. Let me uh, pull them up. All right, first question coming at you will be at the bottom of the page. We'll see it. Uh, yes, you will. All right, so it says, question for Andrew. Can you explain your understanding of the doctrine of incarnation? Yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very great question. I wanted to explain that. I think people often misunderstand... And, and think that incarnation is only limited to personal incarnation, right? But it's not. You can have an incarnation of an attribute, which is the Logos. I'm not denying that the Logos was incarnate. What I'm denying is the Logos is not a person. So it's not a person who became a human person. It's an, it, it, Incarnation is essentially the... the um, uh, I'll, I'll look up a good definition, but it's essentially um, a, a person or an attribute who has become a person. So I say that an attribute has become a person where people would think that an actual person became another person. If we avoid that and understand what the Logos is and understand it's an attribute that's been incarnated in Jesus, it'll clear up a lot of confusion. All right, Sam, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> maybe you can set up a discussion on John 1 and the Logos if it's personal, but real quickly... This again shows that his use of terms are not consistent with the way these words are normally defined. Incarnation is not the embodiment or manifestation of an impersonal attribute in a human being. That is making mincemeat of the term incarnation. Because for the Logos to be revealed in and through the agency of Christ, that's not the Logos becoming flesh. That's the Logos being revealed to Jesus as a messenger who communicates the Logos. In other words, that's what the prophets were doing. The prophets in the Old Testament, what did they do if not communicate the Logos? But no one would say the Logos became incarnate in them. This is simply an inconsistent <clears throat> defining of the term incarnation 
Because again, he's not deriving his theology from the Bible. He's already committed to Unitarianism. And so the Bible cannot mean what it says regarding the Logos being personal and then took on flesh and blood in the historical Jesus of Nazareth. Not Jesus is a man that communicates the Logos or the Logos was revealed in and through him. He is the Logos who becomes human. So again, we need to use terms consistently and accurately and not come up with definitions on the fly to make it agree with Unitarianism. All right, all right, next question. All right, question for Griffin. Do you realize that John the Baptist who prepared the way of Jesus prophesied in Isaiah 40, verse 3, which identifies the ones he's prepared way for is Yahweh? Yep. Yes, that, that's a great question. Again, we're going to have to explain the dynamic there. What it says is that the glory of Yahweh will be revealed. The way that God is with people is through the Messiah, through the presence of the Messiah. All right, so we have to understand that dynamic there. John 17 and 4, Jesus says, I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. I, I think it's in Luke. It says that um, God has visited his people. Right, A great prophet has risen among us. That word visited is a figurative language, meaning that God has looked after his people, not that he's literally with them. So you have to understand the glory of God was revealed through the person of Jesus that they don't share the same glory. It's not, a, it's not the same glory. So, yes, I understand what's said, but we have to explain the dynamic. We can't take a target text from here, a target text from there, and say, boom, slam dunk, we have it. Yeah. All right. Uh, notice, notice what he did again. He read out of Isaiah 40, the plain teaching of Isaiah, and focused on a specific part of the passage and misinterpreted it. It doesn't simply say, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. It says, prepare the way of Yahweh in the desert, make a highway for our God. And then it goes on to say, behold, your God, behold, the Lord God comes with might. And then it says, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. So if I don't impose Unitarianism on Isaiah, Isaiah plainly is teaching. Yahweh himself will come, and if he comes, obviously you're going to behold his glory. Similarly to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6, when he saw Yahweh, he was seeing the glory of Yahweh, but that was Yahweh appearing visibly. He was seeing Yahweh. My eyes have seen the king Yahweh host, but then we're told that was the glory of Yahweh that he saw. So again, this is a false dichotomy. It's either the glory of Yahweh or Yahweh himself. No, it's Yahweh appearing, and in appearing to us, we are beholding his glory, which then brings me to the other point. He said in John 17, 4, I finished the work that you sent me to do. I glorified you. Verse 5, so now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. So Jesus is saying, I existed, not as an idea, alongside of you with the glory you had. And I'm going to challenge Andrew, maybe in a future debate, show me any passage in the Old Testament where you have a creature existing alongside of God in the glory that God alone possesses and show me where such language is used only for predestination or an idea in God's mind that becomes actualized so even John 17 5 refutes him all right all right next question these questions are heavy for you Andrew so don't think I'm intentionally picking all the Andrew questions but another question for Andrew and it says, in your opening statement, you admitted Jesus was the Lord and Savior. How can he not be God when Isaiah 43, 11 says there is no Savior besides him? Yeah, that's a that's another great question. Let me let me pull something up here real quick. And this is a, a common misunderstanding uh, that people have con concerning this, right? Because. It says clearly there's no savior but me, but so Jesus is called savior. So how so obviously Jesus is Yahweh. But the, the Old Testament easily uh dis dis uh disproves this because it says uh let's see, sorry for the delay. So it says I yes, I am Yahweh and there's no savior but me. Judges three nine, but when the Israelites this is the same exact word for savior here. But when the Israelites cried out to Yahweh, he raised up Othniel, son of Kenaz, as Savior to them. Again, they cried out to Judges 3.15. Again, they cried out to Yahweh, and he raised up Ehud, son of Gera, the left-handed Benjamite, as their Savior. 
2 Kings 13.5, So Yahweh gave to Israel a Savior, and they escaped the power of the Arameans. Acts 13.23, 20, uh, From the, the descendants of this man, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. So being a Savior and being Lord doesn't make somebody, even though they sh share that title, it's not the same person that's easily disproved, as I just sh have shown through the Old Testament and the New Testament. All right, Sam? Yeah, Marl, how many minutes do I have, by the way? Just curious, because I'm, I'm like you see, I'm rushing to answer. Do I have like one minute, two minutes? How, how long? Well, I, think, I think two minutes. I'm not really timing, uh, hardcore oh, timing, good, but good. I'll give you about two minutes. Okay. Yeah, because Andrew, again, attacks straw man, either because he doesn't understand what the Trinitarian argument is, or he does, but he can't refute it, so he chooses to attack straw man. It's not simply that Jesus is called Lord and Savior. He's Savior in the same sense that Yahweh is. He saves from sins. So here's my challenge to Andrew. I'm going to quote the text. I want you to show me a single passage in the Old Testament where those so-called saviors save people from their sins. What those contexts are referring to is God raising up judges or kings to deliver his people from oppression, from attacks by pagan nations, but in no instance are they called a savior in the sense of saving Israel from their sins. But that's exactly how the New Testament identifies Jesus. In Matthew 1, 21, she will bear a son, and you are to give to name him, and I'm using New Revised Standard Version, she will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, and he gives the reason why. You call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Andrew knows this, the word Yeshua, shortened form of Yehoshua, means Yahweh is salvation. So the angel is saying, this baby is Yahweh, who is salvation, because he does what the Old Testament says, only Yahweh does, save people from their sins. No other so-called Savior has ever done that, nor can ever do it. And to prove to you that this means that Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh, Psalm 130, verses 7 to 8. O Israel, hope in Yahweh, Yahovah. With Yahweh, for with the Lord, Yahweh, there is steadfast love. And with him is great power to redeem. It is he, Yahweh, who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. But the angel said, Jesus saves his people from their iniquities. Easy challenge to Andrew to show us that Jesus is not Savior in the same way that Yahweh, Yahweh is. Quote a single passage where someone other than Yahweh saves people from their sins. You won't find it. Game over. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. And no one was saved from their sins in the Old Testament. So it's an argument from silence. Okay. All right. Next question. Coming, <laughs> coming at you. All right. Question for Sam and Andrew. Who is the Holy Ones in Proverbs 33 and 4 when referring to what is his name and what is his son's name? So here, let me read it. I have not, and this is New Revised Standard Version, and this is not a translation done by Trinitarians. Many of them are liberals and Bible deniers. They don't believe the Bible is inspired word of God. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy Ones. Even the New Revised Standard Version puts it in the plural because it's Kadoshim. Kadosh is singular. What Holy Ones does he have no knowledge of that are beyond his ability to comprehend? Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in the hollow of, of the hand? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established, established all the ends of the earth? What is this person's name and what is the name of the person's child? Surely you know. So here it's talking about two holy ones that do things that are beyond comprehension. These two holy ones <clears throat> ascend and descend. These two holy ones wrap the waters in the garment. They control the winds, the waves, and the seas. And they establish the ends of the earth. Well, you don't need to guess because in John 3, 13, Jesus says, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. So he's one of the holy ones, this person's child, recognizing that during the Old Testament period, God's Son was there with God doing incomprehensible acts that only God can do. Now, let's see how the Unitarian is going to get around this. All right, Andrew. Wow, okay. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure. I haven't looked into whether or not I see a, you know, a note at my bot at the bottom of verse, uh, what is it? Uh, verse oh, 30, 3. So is it is it knowledge of the Holy Ones or knowledge of the Holy One? I don't know. Here's the thing. Everybody misunderstands what's going on in this equation. Okay, so this guy says the word, the words of Agar, the son of Jacob, and what he, he's asking is a rhetorical question. Okay, he's saying, surely I'm too stupid to be human. I do not have any understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. 
What he's asking here is, who has ascended into heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind? Who has the garment of waters? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is this person's name? And what is this person, the name of this person's child? The, the question is, they don't exist. This is a rhetorical question. I mean, he's asking what human person has knowledge of these things. Who, who has ascended into heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind? Who, who, is, who is this person? Surely you know it. it. So what Trinitarians do is see later understanding of the Bible, and they oppose that on the text. But it's a rhetorical question. It, he's not even asking who is this person and who is this person's child as if as if God has a child. He's talking about a human being. What is this person's name? Who has done these things? And the, the, the correct answer is nobody has. All right. Next question, Sam. This one's for you. Sam Shimon, in John 8.58, was Jesus responding to the Jews' question regarding his existence or identity? It's ironic. I was just going after George Lepus for such a silly question. It's both. It's his identity and his existence. Because if he existed before Abraham in a timeless manner, then that identifies him. True Jesus will make himself known because I like the man and I want him to come to know the true Jesus because we love him and we don't want him see, see him to be cut off. But here, to prove to you it's both both identity and existence, as if it's an either-or <clears throat> proposition. John 8, 53, are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets also died. Who do you claim to be? Last time I checked, claiming to be something means identity. So it's identity and existence. And why are the two tied in? Because if Jesus existed timelessly, he was there before Abraham came into being, an existence that has no beginning, confirmed by the prologue, then to be eternal, uncreated, identifies you as Yahweh. So why the false dilemma? It's not either or, it's both and. Identity and existence. George Lopez, repent of your heresy and accept Jesus as Jehovah, Yahweh, in the flesh. Andrew, response. Uh, can, you, can you repeat the question? It says, uh, in John 8, 58, was Jesus responding to the Jews' question regarding his existence or identity? Yeah, I mean it's it's well it's 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 kind of kind of both. Um, okay, so so I'll explain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so he says truly. So so they ask him. So Sam brought up uh, I think eight uh, eight fifty three. Who do you claim to be? Right, he's saying who are you greater than Abraham. What we have to understand is that this whole Hold context on, Andrew, is about Hold on. Uh, Andrew, you're this is about Hold mediatorship. On. Huh? You're buffering. Wait, wait. So we want people to hear you. Wait, because I'm looking at the live stream. Okay, it's back. Go ahead, uh, because I don't want the people not to hear you. So go ahead. I appreciate it. And so what people have to understand is that this context is about mediatorship and, 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 and the means of salvation. How, how is it the Jews believed that being a, a de physical descendant of Abraham was enough to get them saved because of the promise uh, made to Abraham? And right, but so so what they ask is, are you greater than Abraham? So that they're getting they're getting heated over here. They're, they're, you know, he's like, I know he's not about to say he's greater than Abraham, right? And when he finally says it, they're about to stone him to death, right? And so he says, so uh, Von Rad says in his commentary on Genesis that Abraham was quote assigned the role of a mediator of blessing in God's saving plan. So there was a plan to save humanity, and Jesus talks about his existence in the mind of God as the Savior, as the mediator um, of, of salvation. So what he's saying is there, like you say that you're a descendant of Abraham, right? And he admits in the same context that they are a physical descendant, but you're not a child of Abraham because you don't do the things that he does, right? So they believe that the Jews was fundamental belief that they believed they could be saved um, because they were just physical descendants of Abraham, and what Jesus is saying, you have to believe in the Messiah, because I, I was I was brought up in the mind of God. I am a supreme savior. I'm the one who everybody talked about. Abraham saw my day, and he rejoiced. All right. This is our last question here. Final question for Andrew. Who is being talked about in Isaiah 53? Is that not Jesus' death being planned, uh, planned Sorry, before he even entered the world? Yes, it is. Again, when, you, when you're dealing with prophecy, 
And this is what gets complex when you're dealing with the, the Word of God. The Word of God was revealed. These people were receiving divine insight into the mind of God, into the plans of God. They were receiving divine insight, right? And so, yes, this is this is talking about Jesus. And again, this is this this is a, a strong verse and an idea for Unitarians. Jesus was in the mind of God as a means of salvation. He is greater than Abraham. So, so I, I guess I I don't know if they're trying to get at me in the, or at Unitarianism in the way that, well, because Jesus was talked about in Isaiah fifty. Three that that somehow means he had literal existence because this speaks about a future glorification and the sins being on him and, and when you read the verse the d distinction between the suffering servant and God is so abundantly clear that that unit that Trinitarians would have to go completely out of the way as I believe they do too often to say that Jesus is actually the person this says and Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yahweh is clearly a person set, and they can say that I assume whatever. I'm, I'm reading the Bible, what it says right here, and it follows throughout the whole Bible. Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Clearly, Yahweh is a different person than this person who he's laying the iniquity on. Sam, your response to that. Yeah, actually, the text proves that the servant, though distinct from Yahweh, has to be God. Why? Because Andrew said he's read it, and it's plain, and it's clear. Well, let's read Isaiah 53, verses 1 and 2 real quickly. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. The context identifies God's servant as his very arm. That's the contextual reading. The arm of Yahweh is the servant. Who does what Isaiah says only God can do because he makes intercession for sinners, right? And he's also <clears throat> the one who acquits them, justifies them in Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. Now, why is that interesting? Because if you read Isaiah about the arm of Yahweh, you'll see that the arm of Yahweh is not some creature brought into being, but it's actually God's own power that God employs to do something that no creature can do. For example, Isaiah 59, 15 to 16. Isaiah 59, 15 and 16. Truth is lacking. Whoever turns from evil is despised. Yahweh saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. Pay attention, no one. And was appalled that there was no one to intervene, to intercede. His own arm brought him victory, and his righteousness upheld him. Yahweh couldn't find anyone worthy enough to enact justice or to make intercession, so he did it in his own power by himself. And Isaiah 63, verse 5. I look. But there was no helper. Pay attention. No helper. No creature worthy to help. I stared, but there was no one to sustain me. So my own arm brought me victory, and my wrath sustained me. And Isaiah 53 says, that's the arm of Yahweh that grew up before Yahweh as a tender plant. The servant of Yahweh who makes intercession, who justifies the ungodly, who bears their sins. But we're just told in these passages... No one was worthy or good enough to do that except Yahweh in his own power. That means the servant can't be a creature, and yet he's distinct from Yahweh. Being the power of Yahweh, he's eternal and one with him. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity in Isaiah 53. Again, an, an, an annihilation of Unitarianism. All glory to Yahweh Jesus in the flesh. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. That concludes the Q&A portion of this debate. And once again, I appreciate both of you joining me on this episode of the Gospel Truth. As always, I always send first-time comers gifts. Andrew, I think I got you a gift. Didn't I send you a gift, Andrew? Marlon, can I say something real quick? Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Okay, right after this, folks, I'm going to go live on my YouTube channel, Shemunian. So join me. Don't leave, God willing. So I just wanted to say that right after this in 10 minutes, God willing. So, And Marlon, thank you for having me. And Andrew, thank you. My prayer is that Jehovah Jesus will reveal himself to you because I like you and we love you enough that we want you to know the true God. All right. So, All right. so I'll, be, I'll be connected with you, Sam, to get your address. I can send you that gift. And Andrew, as always, man, it's good to see you, good to hear you. And I'm praying for you, man. You know, we totally disagree. <laughs> so I'm definitely praying for you, man. And uh, you guys uh, out there, man, thank you guys for joining me. And thank you once again. You guys, send your, send your thanks to Sam and Andrew for a very, very delightful discussion and debate.
All right, fellas, I'll talk to y'all soon. All right, folks, thank you again. Another one in the books. And as always, you know, it's always good to have these discussions, always good to have these debates. And it's, you know, sometimes the, you know, they cross cross each other as far as their vocals and everything, and it's hard to hear each other. But I pray that this debate and this conversation was some what helps was helpful for anyone out there who are struggling in this area, who might not understand the arguments, who might not understand certain contexts of certain chapters or verses in the book of John. Um, I pray that this will help you in that understanding. As you know, the gospel truth is engaging the culture of Christian truth, and we are telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ bled, died, resurrected, and he is our savior, our Messiah, and he is God in flesh. And we just want to make sure that you understand that from the heart of the gospel truth. Um, and if I can impress anything on you from this debate, is that take time to study. Take time to understand context. Take time to understand what exegesis is, hermeneutics, the art and science of hermeneutics. Go ahead and dive into this stuff. This stuff is vitally important. And I just, you know, it's, it's, it's important that we continue to learn. We continue to understand as believers. We continue to understand all these things. All right. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go over a couple of announcements. Um, and um, so we'll go ahead and close this show out. All right. All right. Coming up April. Well, I have to restart it. Coming up uh, tomorrow, March 20th, 2020 at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I have a debate. Does the New Testament teach passivism? Uh, that'd be against Todd Lewis and Zach Lesher. So be on the lookout for that one. Make sure it is, you understand that it's 4 p.m. tomorrow, 4 p.m. This debate will be going down. Next up, I will have March 24th, I will have J.C. Jones, and he'll be joining me, and we'll be discussing uh, the face of evangelism. Christians should have a certain presentation, uh, how we present ourselves out there while we're preaching the gospel, and he'll be joining me March 24th. Coming up after that, March 27th, I have Robert Rowe, a theistic evolutionist, versus Seth Bloomsburg, young earth creationist. And they'll be debating which view is biblically consistent, young earth creation or theistic evolution. That's coming up March 27th, 2020, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And lastly, uh, abolitionist for incrementalist debate, T. Russell Hunter versus Ryan Williams. And they're debating which approach towards abortion is more biblical. That's coming up April 6th, 2020 at 6 p.m., Pacific Standard Time. So once again, be on the lookout for all these debates coming up and go ahead and like the YouTube and Facebook page and make sure that you go ahead and subscribe. All right. Don't don't forget. Don't forget to do that. Don't leave the channel without doing that. All right. But with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. And I just want to thank you once again from the bottom of my heart for supporting our ministry, the gospel truth. And let's continue to share this content. Get the gospel out there. Get it out there. Don't waste any time. Share, subscribe, like the whole nine and support this ministry any way you possibly can. All right. Just want to thank you once again. May God bless you and may God keep you. I'm gone.